Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent just shy of 14 years as a U.S. Navy SEAL, five deployments as a U.S. Navy SEAL, and then four deployments as a <clears throat> government contractor. You guys know what that is. He's the CEO of Spartan 7, uh, which taglines SEALs doing business beyond the battlefield, and it's basically a two-prong company that does executive leadership training as well as security. He's the chief administrative officer for American Addiction Centers, focusing on veteran therapy, addiction, and mental health. His nickname is Taco, but ladies, I can assure you, he is the whole enchilada. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> welcome to the stage, Dan Taco Cerillo. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. How did you get the nickname Taco? Uh, it's funny, interesting story. Um, is that a seals or racist story? It was a seals or racist <laughs> story, yeah. So, uh, But it came from another Mexican guy, so we we're in third phase. We just got back from the island, and... Um, Every night, you know, now we're partying it up, right? Yeah. So every night I'm going out and partying it up and come back. And and uh, one night I took my buddy Pete Musselman, who's now like U.S. SOCOM, or U- USACOM Master Chief, right? I took, yeah. took his Jeep down to Roberto's, grabbed some real tacos, came back. Yeah. Johnny Rodriguez, who just retired from the teams, he's like, next morning, he's like, hey, man, did you drive last night? I'm like, well, yeah, I was hungry. He's like, dude, don't drink and drive. I'm like, well, you know, and you know, I'm like 19, 20, and fucking make a lot of cheeses. So the next day, he's like, hey, if you go out again tonight, just tell me. I'll drive you. So, of course, now it's Tuesday night or, I don't know, Monday night, whatever. <laughs> Knock on the door, Johnny, you're going to take me down to Roberto's, get some tacos. So after about three nights of this shit, on like the third night, he, he was like, I woke him up and he's like, taco boy, you need to, <laughs> you need to fucking you need to chill out, man. I'm yeah. like, dude, I'm hungry, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, like now I'm a big old fat guy, but I was like 160 back then, burning yeah. like 20,000 calories yeah. a day, right? So I came out to quarters the next morning, right there on the remember our little our little grinder there at 618. Oh yeah. And uh, everybody's like, Taco Boy, Taco Boy, Taco Boy. So my first platoon, it was Taco Boy. Oh, and then after I started punching dudes in the face, it just became taco. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking classic, man. I, uh, I mean, I figured it was something to, to that effect, but uh, that's fucking classic. And I mean, it's stuck, man. I know it's most stuck. most people still call you that. Yeah, people still yeah. call it to me this day. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's I get shocked by it too because you know my real big job. I, nobody, you know, every now and then somebody like Taco, I'm like, yeah, who the fuck? Yeah, who the fuck are you? Yeah. <laughs> do you, uh, do any of your family members, kids, fucking? I mean, they just call you dad. I'm assuming they're just dad. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I think the only. Like my best friend Frankie, who was at Team Five, uh, we came in the teams together. He still calls me Danny. Yeah. Um, my other best friend Robert calls me Danny. We all went to high school together. We wrestled together the whole gig. But almost every team guy, very few people know me as Dan. Yeah. Everybody knows me as Taco. You know? Yeah. I mean, for I mean, for years before, I mean, it was years after you got out before I even knew your real fucking name. Yeah. You know, uh, which yeah. Saved my ass a couple times too. Yeah. You know, police come to t- Seal Team One like we're looking for Taco. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got no taco, no, no here. taco here. Yeah, that's fucking classic. Uh, what is uh, what? What is the fate? Well, actually, before I even say that, did your parents have a nickname for you at all? Uh, no, <laughs> not, not any good ones. Yeah, <laughs> what? They just swore at you a lot. Um, yeah, well, I, I only had a mom, yeah. um, and uh, you know, mostly it was Dan- when I, she was pissed. It was Danielle. Danielle, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and when it was, I was being a good boy, it was Danny. So, yeah, yeah. that's fucking classic. Uh, what's your favorite U.S. city that you've not lived in? That I've not lived in. Uh, wow. I would probably say Missoula. Really? Yeah, I, just, I love Montana. Yeah, you've done a lot of the uh, Spartan 7 stuff up there. A lot right? of Montana. Yeah. I just, I just, something about it, I, I just feel like a, I, I just feel relax there yeah. it's just you know it's just beautiful no i mean it's for sure a, an at-home kind of place and i think you know the human the human condition if, if you want to call it that um, belongs you know largely in, in those environments i think that's why excuse me so many people are crazy and fucking depressed and and uh live such stressful lives is because they they rarely spend any time in that and, and that uh that's not not healthy but yeah, and I got ruined. I, I I met a guy named Brian Valentine. He's actually a pretty famous guy. I didn't know who he was when I met him. Um, it was back when I owned gyms. You know, he walks in the gym and he's like, "Hey, I won this Montana sheep tag." I had no idea what a Montana sheep tag was. No, no idea it cost like a quarter million dollars to win the thing. 
And he's like, I want you to train me to go hunt this sheep. And I'm looking at the dude. I'm like, I'm not training you. <laughs> Just join the class, you know? Yeah. Anyway, we got to know each other and he took me to, you know, he always talked about, Hey, I have a ranch and you know, I'm, I'm, I didn't, I wasn't financially astute back then. I had, my degree was in finance, but I never, I never realized that even though I worked for Paul Allen, I knew that kind of money, but I didn't know that I didn't know what money was. And yep. so Brian takes me to this ranch in Montana, 7,000 acres. And you know, when you, when you start learning what the math is on that, it's pretty crazy. And it just ruined me because the land was so beautiful. It was so vast. Yeah. And, um, from that point on, man, I just, every chance I get, I go to Montana and I just, you know, basically let what little hair I have left down and yeah. I just enjoy it. You know, yeah. just put my backpack on and just walk and shoot gophers. And yeah, no, and, you know, I got to do a lot of, of big animal hunts with videoing. So I'm, I don't hunt big animals. You know, I think they're cool. But I, I'll take hunters out there and I'll video the hunt for them, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, which, do you have a craziest celebrity security story that you can share? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the best one is, uh, I was obviously I worked for Paul Allen for a long time. We're at the Super Bowl down in Miami. And the Miami venue was not very well secured at the, at the, at the suite level. So most suite levels, they have a lot of security and people aren't allowed to move suite to suite. Well, anyway, uh, we got Brad... Pitt and his son in there, all the crowds, whatever, got him in the, in the, into this uh, suite and crowds kind of formed. Well, at halftime, Angelina writes and she's like, hey, I'm in the parking lot. So I had to go down there and grab her, take her up to the suite. And nobody saw her. So it was cool. I, mean, I got her in there, like got her past everybody. just had her hoodie pulled down. And while she's in the suite, she's trying to drink her water bottle. She sits on the edge and she drops a water bottle down in the crowd. Oh, God. And they catch it on camera. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's, you know, it's national news. And by the time we came out of that suite, it is just wall to wall people. Yeah. So I had to keep them in the suite, go find the regular security guy. I'm like, Hey, I need 30 guys here right now. So he's scrambling. I see a Miami Dade police officer. I'm like, Hey man, I'll give you a $3,000 donation. Get all the officers up here right now. And I'll take you guys party. I don't care what you got to do. Get me some bodies. So it's just myself and my buddy, Phil Forbes and Phil Forbes works for me now. So we're trying to get Brad and Angie and Paul. And really, Brad and Angie are guests of, of Paul. So my primary focus is getting Paul out. And he's getting bumped. He's getting bruised, whatever. And it's, it's funny, kind of a Chris Rock story, too. You know, Chris Rock's the news. Um, we get to the VIP exit. And the morons had decided to put the VIPs and the press exit at the same place. So, of course, it's just chaos. So I'm trying to get Paul through the crowd. And in front of me is Chris Rock and David Spade and all these guys. And I, I pretty much, you know, Chris Rock weighs about 150 he got moved out of the way. And so as I'm going through the crowd, this guy gets in front of us and he's like, you know, basically he got his camera, he's trying to get pictures. And I'm like, Hey, please, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. You know, get out of the way, sir. And essentially he's like, you don't, you don't fucking tell me what to do. And I punted him. No oh, shit. I just, so you and him. Will Smith have a lot in common. Yeah. <laughs> so not, not Chris Rock, some, just some oh, random gotcha. dude. Mother so then we, you know, we, we get the go-karts and we have to get out of there. And it, it almost felt like being back overseas again, where you're like, you're literally trying to evade this crowd oh, to get, get these damn. guys to the bus. And, but uh, that was a pretty crazy story, and you know a couple other ones. I've I've, I've had I've had a good time. You know, Paul had yeah. Paul surrounded himself with celebrities. Yeah. So I got to be around a lot of people and see the goods and the bads of those people. Yeah. Um, I mean, can you? you I mean, I, I know the the list of people that you've worked for or, or done things with. I'm assuming a lot of them you can't mention. I'm and, under no. My confidential agreements are all expired now. Oh, I mean, no the sure. ones that are current, I don't mention. Um, yeah. A couple of them that I, you know, people type my name and they're going to come up. But yeah, um, you know, I've been lucky enough. I got to work for Paul Allen for six years, uh, and then I got recruited to go work for Sergey Brin, who's co-founder of Google. That was awesome. Great guy. Great family. Um, nothing but good experiences there. And when I rolled off to you know run Open Spartan Seven, uh, lucky enough to be linked up with some a couple of cool celebrities and uh you know one of which obviously is a big podcaster and um takes takes very well good care of me and my staff yeah and uh from there we've now got a pretty good vast array of clients yeah. and um a lot put a lot of guys to work yeah yeah no it's awesome man i uh, i love to see it i mean i know you've been doing it for a while but uh yeah it's, it's such a cool progression to see you move move through that that way um what's the last song you downloaded uh, and and even if it's an embarrassing one, if it's, it's Taylor Swift or some it's, shit, I, you know I'm, I'm really into music. But yeah. I, 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 here's the bad part: I'm you're caveating music. it with "I'm really into music." <laughs> I'm into music, but I don't really know artists. Yeah. Anytime I hear a song on TV, 
I just go on, I go on, uh, what's Soundhound? that? The, the app where you pull Shazam. Oh, yeah. I find the song and pull it up. And I think it was like a David Lee Roth song. Cause I, I oh, just bought sure. a new car. Yeah. Like about a 67 Malibu convertible. Really? And so, you know, I play eighties music in there. <laughs> like Banana Ram. I don't care, man. <laughs> and, uh, I think the last one was a David Lee Roth song. All right. So rock. I mean, I can get behind that. Yeah. I'm wrong with that. I thought it was going to be like Taylor Swift or some pop, some <laughs> hey, there, pop, Carmen some Taylor pop Swift bullshit. In there. <laughs> I call yeah. it my soul music. Yeah. So I have two, two podcast, two, uh, Two uh, playlists, one yeah. my workout music, yeah. and then one's my soul music, and, yeah. and that's just... I dig it. Music's a big a big deal in my life, <coughs> yeah. and I always have it playing. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. Um, what's the best Halloween costume that you've pulled off? Batman. No oh, shit. Yeah, so how, my how whole long family, ago was that? we deserved dressed as superheroes, and this was when I was competing, you know, I was trying to, was trying to win a CrossFit Games, and I was really crazy fit, whatever, and, um, you know, my body was, all the surgeries had been done, and... And I wore a Batman outfit. And I remember looking in the mirror, going, "God damn, bro, you're good. You don't like you don't even need these fake abs right now." <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. Because I mean, you owned a CrossFit gym for I a while. Four of them, yeah. Still? No. no. Oh yeah. Because that, that shit's a fucking nightmare, isn't it? It's a uh, it, yeah. it, you know, it's if you want to lose a lot of money, open yeah. gyms. <laughs> yeah. uh, they were great. I had fun. My kids grew up in gyms. My kids are super athletes. Yeah. You know, great family time. Great time to learn about. I, learned, I, I don't know how to run a business. I know how not to run one yeah. because of the CrossFit gyms. Yeah. And um, was able to get in, you know, in incredible shape, but it's you don't make any money. Yeah, it sucks, I, you know? well, it seems like one of those things where most of them don't. It's almost like like Amway or like pyramid shit, where it's yeah. like there are some that crush it, but most don't. We were crushing it for a long time, and then two things happened to us. One, we had this three hundred space parking lot. So Seattle, there's no parking, so we had a three hundred space parking lot. City of Bellevue came in, seized the parking lot for right of eminent domain to expand the garbage dump. So that right there in itself took us from 720 clients within a year. We were down to 220. Wow. Turns out people who are fit don't want to walk in the rain. Weird, yeah. right? And uh, <laughs> the, the next one was we had some city inspector. Well, we got a letter from the state of Washington saying, hey, we want to you to do LED lights. So I put all the LED lights in there. A city inspector came in to you know find this, sign the permit. And she wrote us over 27 violations of stuff that whatever. I didn't even own the building. Oh, wow. And... Um, about a million and a half dollars later, we were basically broken um, to the point where I actually put on my dress blues, went down to my to the hearing with the city, and essentially said, "In six weeks, I'll be solvent," okay. because of you know I had to do a parking study, I had to level out the parking lot, even though I didn't own the building, create six handicapped parking spaces, even though I didn't have any handicapped people, yeah, and to do all these things, and I'm like, I, I don't own this building. And they're like, yeah, but you occupy it, and uh, it's just you know. It's it's government crap and yeah. and uh, well, yeah, I mean it, it seems like Seattle is not exactly the most business friendly nah, city wasn't. to begin with but so yeah that 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 was the that cost us a lot of money and during the same time obviously my wife was pretty sick and I just said you know I'm, yeah. I quit man yeah fuck man um, what is your morning routine uh, typically with days that you're in town and just a normal normal day oh man they're absolute I'm a very absolute person in my yeah. morning routine so I wake up first thing I do is obviously go take care of business while I'm reading take care of business I uh, I read the paper. What time? So I'm, I wake up generally about 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. So sometimes As opposed to 5 a.m. in the evening? Uh, <laughs> As opposed to 5 a.m. in yeah. the evening? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, I wake up about 5, 4.35. You know, I don't use an alarm clock. I have uh, just let wake up with the sunlight, read my paper, and uh, I either go ride my bike. Um, I'm a big Netflix guy, so that's when I watch TV. I get on Netflix, find some kind of documentary or oh, something. Oh, shit. First thing in the morning. I uh, ride my bike, huh. and then... Uh, I'll, I have a swim spa, so either I'll ride my bike or I'll swim spa or I'll verse the climb. Those are the three things that I like doing. I don't get I don't get hurt when I do them. Yeah, and uh, do a little bit of stretching, nothing big, and I, I make my I make my my cappuccino or my tea, and then I just spend time with my wife. You know, my wife and I. The morning's really important to us because it's our time. So I, I generally leave the house about eight thirty. So once she wakes up, I'll just kind of always have her coffee ready for her and. Just kind of spend time with her. We have these two chairs in our bedroom. We just sit there and we have a river in our backyard. And you spend a lot of time together. Very quiet time, yeah. you know. You're in the and Nashville uh, area now. Nashville, right? yeah, right, right in Franklin. Yeah. And, um, you know, then I basically go to work. And once I go to work, it's just work. Like yeah. I, I, I don't, I have two distinct lives. I have a work life and I have a home life. And then um, work is work, man. And my biggest part, the end of my routine is, Obviously, there's you know many parts to that, but the end of the routine is when I pull into my office, I say to myself two things. My problems are not their problems. And I say it twice, makes seven people smile. And then I walk into my office. And it's really important for me because I'm a very angry person, right? It's in my nature to be angry and hostile. And 
that's a way for me to go, don't be an asshole, right? Like go out of your way to be nice to people. And, and, and it really has helped me a lot. Yeah. Like just having that mentality and um, spending time with my wife. And those aren't things that I invented. I've learned them from other men who I really admire. Yeah. You know, Tom Shea and Derek Price, Chris Smith. Um, Chris Smith, Tom Shea Seals, obviously. And uh, it's made my life so much better having that morning routine. What I found is that when I was, my life was in chaos, you know, when I was a big alcoholic, my wife was very sick, my businesses weren't doing good, I had no routine. It was just chaos. And now that I've really controlled that aspect, everything is so easy. You know? Yeah. I, to me, the, the thing that really sticks out in all of that is my problems are not their problems. Yeah. Which I think uh, agreed for me is something that, uh, that I would pull from this interview and, and remind myself of because I know there are times where I certainly fall victim to that where, you know, the people around me that I care about end up paying for uh, things that they have nothing to do with. You yeah. know, um, it's, it's something that I struggled with uh, a lot more when my kids were younger you know, the, it was just, just getting out of the military, coming from being a SEAL instructor. I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying that th these were the things that seemed to impact me the most negatively uh, that, that kind of all came to, together at the same time. But, you know, <clears throat> I was I was 30, you know, didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I, I got out of the military kind of unexpectedly because of the lung, lung problem that I had. Um, young kids started a new business, didn't know what the fuck I was doing, you know, just a lot of different things kind of all swirling around at the same time. And, and I was harder on my kids than, than I should have been. And, and for sure than that, than they deserved, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, luckily I, I, I feel like, you know, I've learned a, a lot along the way in, in all aspects and especially with them having kind of come full circle to where, uh, you know, it's not that way and, and hasn't been for years. And, and even, you know, they're old enough to, to where, you know, we, we've talked about it and, and getting their perspective on it and, and how, how different things are now in a good way is, is pretty rewarding and, and validating. Um, but I, I certainly can resonate with, with that statement. It's so simple, but just so, so poignant, I think. But yeah, you know, and, and I'll always tell you, you know, you're always harder on yourself than you probably need to be. I, I felt the same way that I, I felt like I was very hard on my kids. And I look at my kids now, my kids are incredibly successful. You know, my son, you know, he's, he's just blowing the doors off business. My daughter's with Circus Soleil. She actually goes on tour to, in Saudi Arabia here in two weeks. And oh, I'm shit. so excited with that. Yeah. And my youngest son, you know, he built supercars and now he wants to go on the teams. But I look at that and I always felt like I was too hard on them. And to talk to them today, they're like, they're like, dad, we're, I'm, we're glad you were hard on us because like we don't have, they don't, they don't have drug issues. They don't have party issues. They don't have work ethic issues, you know? And I, I, I always look at those times like, man, I should have been gentler. And then to come to find out, they're like, dad, you were very gentle, yeah. you know? And it's, it's hard because I didn't get, I wasn't raised that way. I was yeah. raised very hard. Yeah. And so I think, you know, for us, we look at it and we go, man, we were really hard. I, I think you were a great father. Oh, no. well, should I appreciate no. it. I, so. I mean, the, the interesting thing, mo most guys that I know had, had tough childhoods, like most guys that I, I end up, you know, befriending or, or being close with and at different periods in my life, I would say generally all have that in common. Um, you know, broken families or super abusive upbringings. You know, the, the interesting thing for me is I, I didn't have that. Like my parents are still together to this day. I mean, they've been married 50 fucking years and I've never heard them argue. Not one fucking time, e even now. Um, you know, I've, I've never heard either of them raise their voice at one another. Uh, I mean, they, they rarely even fucking disagree on anything. Um, you know, and, and I've got two older brothers, a younger sister, and, and all four of us, our childhoods were, were very benign comparatively to a lot of people that I know. You know, they weren't perfect, uh, but it was much more leave it to beaver than it was breaking bad, you know, and um, and, and it's just it's interesting the, the way that that affects how you parent. And, and sometimes it, it over prepares you or you make, over, you know, kind of overcorrect for things that happen. And sometimes you, you go the other way. But uh, but it's it's, yeah, it's interesting the, the similarities that I find between, you know, most of the really, really good dudes that I know all had fucking horrible upbringings, which then begs the question, like, are they the men that they are because of the, the adversity they had at that age? Or, you know, it, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to try to reconcile. Yeah. I've, I've come to terms that 
I am who I am today and I was able to accomplish the things that I accomplished because of my childhood, you know, and, um, you know, in Buds, I, I have no problem saying that Buds was really easy for me. Yeah. Like I never really struggled, you know, and I, I was really surprised when guys would quit. Like, what are you quitting for? And I look back on that a lot and I, I you know, the first time I ever had three meals in a day was in joining the Navy. Yeah. And the first time I ever had my own room was when guys quit at Buds. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> and, uh, buddy. Those, those, those things, and I'm like, you know, this could be a lot. And to me, I, I expected the day I arrived in Buds to be Hell Week. I thought that's every day would be. And when I remember the first day, like, okay, go home. I'm like, on home. purpose? You know, yeah. like, so I thought they were going to come to our room. And, you know, when they secured Hell Week, and they kept telling you, remember during the Hell Week, they're like, hey, we're going to come get you. This isn't over. This isn't over. We're going to go till yeah. Sunday. So I didn't, I, when we were in the classroom, I just sat there, like, <laughs> and dude's like, hey, man, you need to sleep. I'm like, uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah. Uh, not, not me, man. Like, yeah. I'm not, uh, they're not, not surprising me. Yeah. And so finally, when I finally went down, went, went to sleep, and I got to see a lot of things at night. It's like, you know, people were wondering, you know, how, how these guys died right after Hell Week, et cetera. I got to see those situations because I didn't go to sleep and seeing Chris Forrest go into convulsions and Ralph Johnson go into convulsions. And, you know, people don't realize how badly your bodies are just completely destroyed at the end of Hell Week. Yeah. And so, you know, when I went through that, I look at it all now and go, everything that I endured as a child, nothing in Bud surprised me. You yeah. couldn't call me anything. You couldn't hurt me. You couldn't starve me. You couldn't freeze me because it had all been done before and it had been done hundreds upon hundreds of times. And, you know, a lot of people I think would, would take that as like, oh, this is going to destroy my life. I look at it now and I'm like, thank you. Yeah. You know, like I've, I've, I've ended a point in my life where I was full of gratitude and I really, I've made peace with it. And, you know, like I know my mom did the best she could in the situation she was given. Every man she ever had in her life abused her, you know, just brutalized her and she brutalized the people she could, you know, on top of it. And, and, uh, but I look at it and I'm like, you know, she was 15 years old. She was a little girl when she started having us. She did the best job she could in the circumstance she was given. And fuck, thank you. Cause I wouldn't be, a, I wouldn't be a person. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't her. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, and I look at that a lot and I'm like, uh, yeah, it sucked. You know, but I made sure I didn't do that to my children. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I think I went overboard sometimes. Like I, I, when we didn't have any money, my kids always had the best as yeah. much as I could give them. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's wild. I mean, speaking of which, where where did you grow up? Let's talk about your childhood. Yeah, so I was born in Othello, Washington, which is a little town outside Moses Lake. Um, I actually come from a pretty prominent family. So my grandfather had some of the biggest farms in the state of Washington. My uncle owned the biggest trucking company in the state of Washington. My uncle died, didn't know a lot about the law. So there was no pass down, right? So there was no will. So that kind of, that, that trucking company floundered and eventually closed down. Then when my grandfather uh, divorced my grandmother, got remarried. Uh, there again, no will. He died, and so his wife Caroline inherited the farms. Well, then she lost her mind, was committed to a mental institute, and my family. You know, this is before me. I was a little kid, so never got to, but it basically lost everything. And so my grandfather's farms are now owned mostly by Anheuser Busch, so which King Corporation. So my uncle Lamar worked for Anheuser Busch for you know twenty, thirty years before he died. And um, th- th- that company took very good care of him, but that family legacy that my grandfather had built essentially dissolved upon their deaths. Oh. You know, and his brother Ozzy owned the trucking <clears throat> company, he owned the farms, and so that, that, that was where I grew up in Othello. And then my mom married a military guy, and so we went to San Diego. So I spent a lot of my childhood between San Diego and Pensacola, kind of back and forth, and um, was in Pensacola playing high school football. I got recruited to go to college. I uh, went to Charleston Southern, played Charleston Southern for a year and a half, and then basically quit. I was going to get kicked out anyway because I just didn't give a shit and joined the teams. Yeah. So most, but, of my, most of my childhood was San Diego. And so from a, a young young kid growing up in, in kind of the, um, the the tough parts of your childhood that really made buds easier than, than it would be for most people, what, what were the circumstances – with which that was possible if she's married to a military guy, like, was he gone all the time? She was alone. And and so like, how how did that kind of pan out? Yeah. So she was gone. And you know, my mom, my mom's addiction was men. So when she was alone, you know, other men would would come and occupy the space. And, um, you know, that that you, you look at it now, that was her trauma. You know, everybody has a trauma. And, uh, so some of those men that came in her life were not good. And then when my stepdad came back from deployment, they divorced you know, then other men came in through, came through the door, you know, and uh, the last guy she was married to treated her very well, you know, took very good care of her and she died very peacefully. And 
you know, full of love in a very loving environment. So I'm very thankful for that. But, yeah. you know, the, some of the men that came in her life were good. Some were bad. And, um, you know, when I turned 14, I stopped fighting boys. I started fighting men because I found out that I was really strong. And um, some of her boyfriends, they, they, they learned, I, I learned that I could defeat grown men at a very early age. Yeah. So. Uh, so, I mean, in that environment, I mean, were there times, like, were you on base housing or out in town? Or? No, out in town. Yeah. I never so. lived in base housing. So mostly east side San Diego. I grew up, a lot of my life was in Logan Heights. Oh, sure. you know, my, my, my stepdad, when I, they got married, was E1. You yeah. know, and by the time, I think by the time they divorced, he was an E5. So there was no, you know, regular Navy yeah. guys don't make a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, so we lived in, you know, wherever wherever we could afford rent. So. Yeah. And so he's gone a lot. She's there alone and, you know, focused on other other guys. And so you're just kind of left uh, to your own devices yeah. or to fend for yourself or what? Yeah. So I just kind of taught myself, you know, the things I needed to, to survive in those environments, you know, and that was during the, the crack epidemic, you know, and I got to see a lot of the consequences of that, which is probably why I've never did drugs. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was rough, r- rough, t- rough time, but you know, I learned a lot Yeah. and I learned how to defend myself. I learned how to be very street smart. I learned wh- how to spot really bad people really quickly. You know? Yeah. So, um, from, from that standpoint, um, like the, the street smart and, um, just going through those types of environments or, or situations rather, uh, were there times where you got completely screwed over, got the shit beat out of you, got, you know, what, what, what were some of the, uh, the scenarios that took place during that time that really taught you um, some of these things? I never got the shit beat out of me. I did get, I did get close to getting the shit beat out of me one time. I got jumped and guys took my bike, but I was, I mean, I've always been fast, you know, so I was able to just run from that. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, my best friend growing up, um, Sean, he got killed. Um, that sucked, you know, we're Balboa park and just happened to be dr- walking by a drug deal going bad. And, you know, the after effects, he got shot and died later on, you know, so, and, and then kind of seeing, I was very close with his family because his, his mom was pretty nice lady and his stepdad was pretty cool and kind of seeing them just, just dissolve after that happened, you know, she became a very serious crack addict and, and the stepdad went to jail and, yeah, and, uh, you know, it's just, it was just rough time, you know, in the 80s in San Diego, you know? Yeah. I remember mine and Sean's big thing with To Escape was movies cost 25 cents back then. Yeah. So we'd go in the, in the theater to watch Goonies, and we'd just stay there all day long. Yeah. Like, just <laughs> stay here all day long. It's safe, and there's air conditioning. Big yeah. deal. Yeah. You know? And uh, get one thing of popcorn for the two of us. And, yeah. Uh, uh, did you have siblings? I had a brother and sister, but they have I had a different dad. Oh, okay. So younger they, uh, they live with their dad. Were they younger or older? Older. Older, okay. So you you were more like an only child growing yeah. up, basically. Yeah. Um, did you play sports growing up? Mm-hmm. What uh, what all did you play? Wrestled, basketball, football, baseball, track. You know, yeah. pretty much anything that uh, my mom could afford. Soccer. Yeah. I mean, I guess you mentioned football, but um, and you ended up getting a scholarship for that. Yeah. What, so what I got really lucky when we moved to Pensacola completely by accident. Um, turns out we went to the number one high school football team in America. So Emmett Smith was a running back. It was his senior year. I was a freshman. And uh, able to show up to that environment of football, it was like, holy smokes. Like, the, the South lives and eats, breathes football. Like, I coach at Lipscomb Academy in Nashville now. Just it, Football is different, you know? Oh, yeah. And uh, being oh. able to go there and be around these athletes. I mean, just athletes. And when you're around, surrounded by other great athletes, your, your game comes up. Sure. And for me, you know, in, if you, in order to go play college ball, you're either one of two things or both. You're either big or you're fast or you're both. And I was fast, yeah, you know, and so I had the ability to go sideline to sideline and, you know, I, I had good instincts as a linebacker. And so, you know, people saw some talent in me and, and I got, got the opportunity to go play. Yeah. Was the college experience, um, what was that like for you playing football? Oh, it was terrible. Yeah. It was terrible. Yeah. So I went from a team that never lost games to a team that never won games. Mm-hmm. I went to a coach in high school. My coaches were mostly NFL football players who turned coaches. Um, Dwight Thomas is in the coaching hall of fame. Um, so a, a, just a pedigree of coaching, right? You know, I got to go to Mike Singletary's camp in the summer. Uh, John Burnell was my linebacker coach was Mike Singletary's roommate at Baylor. It was a big deal. And so I went to Charleston Southern. It was not that way. Yeah. Uh, most guys were probably failed high school football coaches. Yeah. Um, and, and it was, it was his first year program. So, and no, not taking anything away from them, but uh, never won. Um, I don't even know if we scored. And so going to practice, having guys, guys yell and scream, and I'm sitting here like, you, you, you can't even show me the drill. Yeah. So, and it was a Baptist college. 
you know, and I didn't know that. <laughs> I did know it, but I didn't really pay attention to it. I, I went to college for girls. Yeah, I didn't know what that entailed. You know, what that entailed, like yeah. you had to go to chapel, and I'm like, yeah. what's this? You know, so yeah. it wasn't a good environment for me. And I had walk-on <laughs> offers to go other places, but I wanted to play. Yeah, because you know, I, I didn't have no guidance. Yeah. There was no male figure in my life, and I would just say, hey, man, sit out a year. Go get a free year, get probably get a master's degree for free, et cetera. And no, nobody was there to tell me that. And so yeah. they promised me I'd play as a freshman. I went there, I played as a freshman. Yeah. And uh, at what point did you say, I'm going to join the military and be a SEAL? And, and how did you find out about them and what drove you to do that? Yeah. So in the 11th grade, I was very, very pro military. I was, I wanted to go to the Naval Academy. I wanted to go, you know, Top Gun was out. I wanted to be a pilot, the whole gig, you know. And uh, I didn't get accepted. So I, they told me go to prep school. And of course to me, that was non-acceptance since, you know, I didn't, didn't know the deal. And so I became very anti-military. So I grew my hair, you know, stopped giving a shit, you know, whatever. And, um, basically was completely and utterly against everything to do with the military because we'd moved so many times. <coughs> so within the Academy, did you want to be a SEAL then or you just, no, okay. I didn't know about SEAL teams. Yeah. So I you know, kind of fast forward now my sophomore year of college, well, really my freshman year, cause I didn't, I didn't make the grade. So I'm a repeat freshman, but I'm still eligible. Uh, Friday night, my girlfriend takes me to go see the movie Navy Seals. Yeah, I'm like this is <laughs> awesome. Look at these dudes, you know, like this is cool. Saturday night, big huge Halloween party. You know, we're we're rolling it up, and all my buddies from the other colleges where I played with high school came back to this party, and it was a it was a wild party. You know, six kegs, you know the deal, and a fight happens. So we ended up brawling it up. You know, there's a couple gangbangers, and you know, and uh, the, that night, they came by my house and shot my house full of holes. I wasn't home. And so I got home Sunday. My neighbor's like, dude, you know, cops are all around, whatever. And Monday morning, I was at the recruiter's office. No shit. I just said, hey, man, I, I need to get out of here. Yeah. I'm, I'm going nowhere. I'm working three jobs. You know, I'm like, my whole life was just wake up at 4 a.m., go pick <clears> up <throat> golf balls, go lift weights for, for at school, go to my first class if I decided to go, go back, you know, for another job at, at uh, service merchandise back to class practice then go back to Frankie's fun park and, you know, freaking run some rides, you know? So it was, yeah. it was just, it had no life. So you were a fucking carny. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> so Frankie's fun park was like, yeah, basically a carnival, you know, stationary car carnival in North, North Charleston. It was great though. Uh, so many girls. It was awesome. That's fucking classic. <laughs> that's funny. Um, all right. So you go, you join the military, uh, you go to buds. What buds class are you in? 194. 194. Um, buds was e easier for you than you anticipated. When you graduated, um, walk us through kind of the, the career path of graduation, uh, Benning jump school, and then, and then to, into, what, into what team and kind of how that transpired. Yeah, so first off, I got very lucky, which I you know, want to make sure all the, if there's young guys listening to this, I was able to get a mentor. Yeah, and no, you know, only, I, I run only, a big mentor program now. but Only my, old people listen to this. Show. Yeah, my, my, my mentor is Don Cope, still alive. He actually holds the record for the deepest Navy dive in history. Anyway, Don you know, found out I want to be a SEAL. And he's like, okay, show up my house every morning at 4 a.m. He's like, if you can't beat me on a workout, you're never going to be a SEAL. And <clears> that was beautiful to me because by the time I got to go to boot camp, I was, you know, obviously able to keep up with him and, and do better than him. And he's a 40-year-old guy, right? So I went to BUDS. I uh, went to A school first. Torpedo once made A school. Back they SEALs had to do that. I went to Bethesda, Maryland because it was waiting on my BUDS class. So I was there for four months, which was awesome. I mean, I had so much fun in Maryland, just D.C. I'm such a history buff, you know, yeah. going down the mall every weekend, whatever. And uh, got to Bud's, was an original, went all the way through Bud's first time. And uh, went to SEAL Team 1, did three platoons at SEAL Team 1, was in my fourth platoon, blew my knee out, and uh, went to trade at, or training cell back then. Yeah. Um, did training cell for about a year and a half, was going to screen to go to Damn Neck, and I had a son. So I sat down with his mom, and she's like, if you go to Damn Neck, he's not going with you. She lived in San Diego. I lived in, in, in there. And back then, damn neck, was, nobody was doing anything. So I decided to go to Bud's as an instructor, go back to school, finish my schooling. And I was actually getting out. So I was, you know, the teams, I think I was one of the very few guys who got to do real world missions. We did the shipboarding of the Al-Shahad, which was lame. You yeah. know, nothing was anchored. We, I did the Sri Lanka thing. And I did some of the Philippine stuff, right? But it never, nothing. It was like, this is the teams and this is boring. Yeah. So I was actually on my way out and um, <clears throat> basically was at my son's, my, my third child's ultrasound and September 11th happened. And um, basically looked at my wife and said, I, I can't get out. 
And I think I was about six months from, from end of enlistment back at that point and had an internship with Morgan Stanley. I was going to go be a investment banker the whole gig and, and stayed in, stayed in the teams. Uh, got to go over to group one, uh, deploy with group one for the second time they deployed. And then went over to SEAL Team 7, was plank owner at SEAL Team 7, did two, did two deployments to SEAL Team 7, and one with SEAL Team uh, 1 as an augmentee. All the leadership got fired, so I went over and augmented, thinking I was going back to Iraq with them. And uh, they ended up, we ended up bringing all the guys home. And uh, had no intention of ever getting out of the teams. I loved the teams. You know, I was going to be Master Chief Cirilla one day, and next thing you know, I get called over to WarCom, and they're like, hey, we're going to talk to you about this murder. I'm like, murder? Like, which dude? You know, by then. And uh, they read this name, Manad al Jamadi. I had no idea who that was. And I had been talked about, they talked to me about it before in Mosul, um, my deployment before that. And so I'm giving my statement, same statement as ever. Got in a hand to hand with a guy, you know, threw some chingasos and turned him over. And next day they said he died. And I had to write a report saying this is my actions during the, during the hand to hand fight and the injuries that I think I caused. And, uh, you know, it's, this is an iteration of time. One day I get called back with Warcom again and get told I'm being charged with 27 counts of murder, uh, manslaughter, you name it, every charge you can think of. And I'm kind of sitting there like, what are you talking about? You know, like I got in a hand to hand fight with a guy during the entry. Like how, how does that murder? So didn't know the whole story. Then fast forward, turns out he, uh, went to Abu Ghraib and at Abu Ghraib during interrogation, he died. And so instead of just the, the circumstances surrounding that are obviously there's a lot of publicity about it. I wasn't there, so I really can't like, Hey, here's what happened. I've been told what happened. Um, essentially he was hung up from the bars of the window and suffocated his own blood, but I'm pretty sure he was pretty fucked up before that. I mean, I, 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 I tried to hurt. I tried to kill him. Yeah. So I'm not going to, not going to say I didn't. Right. We won't, And that was the very first mission we had. It was a killer capture. So we weren't supposed to capture him. We were going to kill him anyway. And that um, specific guy. Yeah. That yeah. specific guy. He was the leader of the uh, movement, uh, the uh, army of God, um, Medi Army or whatever, and they were the guys who had captured four American National Guard guys, gutted them, beheaded them, booby trapped their bodies, and so we, we, he was he was going to get it right. So I went through that whole thing, um, and it all started unfortunately with a seal that we had kicked out, caught him stealing, kicked him out of the teams, and he went to the base our commodore and said, "If you kick me, I'm going to tell everybody what we did at Abu Ghraib." That's when the photos were coming out. And instead of, you know, the command using it, infinite wisdom just to check the sign-in logs and going, well, shit, none of these guys are ever here, they decided to charge 14 of us. So when it was all said and done, three of us were left holding a bag, went to court-martial. As I was walking into the court-martial, they offered me a plea bargain, which was to testify against Lieutenant Ledford, which I'm like, he didn't do anything wrong. If anything, he's the guy that kept us from doing stuff wrong. Like, he was the, the guy holding the leash of the pit bulls, you know? Yeah. And uh, so <clears throat> got a plea bargain get on the test witness stand, knowing what they're going to try to do. And basically said, the guy never did anything wrong. He wasn't there. We, we didn't, we only did one interrogation ever. Right? That wasn't our gig. We captured dudes. We turned them over. And then, you know, got cleared of everything, stayed in the Navy, and then just had a really bad taste in my mouth. And, you know, I just got offered a job to go do government stuff. And the paycheck was astronomical. You know, it was like 30 grand a month. And I was <coughs> like, you know, talk to my wife. And she's like, if you stay in, you're stupid. I kind of sat there and I'm like, you know, I've done everything for this thing. I've deployed multiple times. I've, you know, and I never, I'm not a big eye guy. But it was just kind of the first time ever I was like, fuck this. Fuck this. Yeah. You know, and I'd seen what had happened to some other really good dudes. And I seen the guys at the agency and, you know, government entities that they were, the, the money they were making, the, the 60 day deployments. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go do some me time, you know? Yeah. So I did that, and uh, you know, the, the, unfortunately, that story kept going for years and years. I get called to D.C. to testify, and turns out, you know, the long story, the, the, the bad part of the story is that our CO was uh, now Admiral Cromgard. His dad is Buzzy Cromgard, Director of Operations of the CIA, and his uncle was Fred Cromgard, Secretary General of the United, of the United States. And so essentially it was, uh, let's punish the guys at the lowest level to protect him. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the, the guys who got left holding the bag, it sucked. And, you know, I, I don't fault anybody. The situation is what it is, but it definitely put a bad taste in my mouth and definitely caused me to, to look at the teams in a very different way of saying, this is a job, yeah. and this job is coming to an end. Yeah. No, I, I don't blame you. I mean, there's a million, not a million. There, there are a lot of other stories similar to that of guys that I know really well that 
got uh, similarly railroaded that way yeah. uh, unjustly, in my opinion. Can you uh, kind of walk us through that that specific mission of, of how that went down? Yeah, so we had been working in Mumadia for about a month and a half, two months, and we were just wreaking havoc on those guys. Like we were, we were, we were, we were busting them up pretty bad. And that was the only cell we were working, and our source was part of that 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 cell. And so he had rolled on his homeboys. And, uh, you know, basically was giving us the farm. So that day we were looking, waiting for this guy to come home. They met at El Jamadi, just waiting for him to come home. We did the seat, did the uh, ISR past his house. And, you know, Blinky, Chris Campbell, God rest his soul, got clean photos of him. We're looking for a six foot four Iraqi wearing a blue track suit. And Blinky got photos we're like, shit, he's there, you know. And we've been probably waiting for him about four or five days. And so we got ready that night and it was like, it was no hold bar. We were going to, we were going to end that dude's life, you know? So came up on the house, of course, as normal, bad intel. You know, I'm told it was a steel door or a, excuse me, a wood door, steel door at the end of the hallway on the right. So I go up there with a slap, with a, with a double uh, sided charge, you know, two pieces of uh, conveyor belt to have a pushing charge. Blow the door, turns out it's a wood door. So Intel's wrong there. We blow the door. Uh, I'm probably number six into the house because I was the B breacher that night. Jay was the A breacher. And as soon as we get in there, Lieutenant Leverage is like, go soft, go soft, go soft. This is the wrong house. This is the wrong house. And there's furniture in there. And there's like, you could tell this was not a bad guy's house, right? So we just like, whoa. I put the brakes on really quick inside the house. And first guy we see is like a five foot two Iraqi. Like, hey, dude, just sit down, relax. Probably in there one minute. Uh, Ledford's like, hey, it's this door over here. He's like, Taco, get over here. And I go to the door, and there's two doors. I'm like, which one? He's like, this one. I'm like, how do you know? He's like, I just know. So he's just awesome platoon commander, straight-up warrior, best one of the best officers i ever worked for. So I put the charge on the door, get everybody back behind me, like, hey, get behind me. We start going. I had to, and I had to get the set point going down the stairs. There's just no room, right? And it, 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 the gig is up already, right? We've already blown the charge. And the lights are starting to pop on in the city, right? And, you know, my hair on the back of my neck standing. And right as I get about six feet from the door, you know, and you know how we did our charges. I won't talk about how we did our charges, but, you know, I, I got it open. No one else coming out. And I saw this about that fast of light. And I'm like, what the fuck was that? And I look at Mark Carter. God rest his soul, too. And I love that dude. I look at him. He didn't see it. I'm like, and then I heard something go. And I'm like, fucking that door is open. And it was probably me to you. And I just fucking, bam, I kicked the door as hard as I could. And there's this six foot four Iraqi. <laughs> and so me and him went at each other. And I, I just kept trying to get him to the ground. And I couldn't get him to the ground. And so I slammed him left. And as soon as I slammed him right, we went into this doorway. And everybody just blew by. I guess they never saw us go in that doorway. We landed on this table. And, you know, I'm at, with all my gear on, I'm probably 300 pounds. So it's just you and him. Just me and him, yeah. And I'm on top of him. And, you know, I'm doing, I can't get to either one of my weapons. And we're on this table, and all of a sudden the table goes, bam. So we just fall, and the table collapses. And I keep trying to get to my pistol, but this fucking table's here, right? So I can't get to my pistol. I wasn't carrying a knife. I was carrying a folder, right? So I'm like, I can't even get to that. So I'm just headbutting him. I'm doing anything I can, right, to, to freaking get on him. He's got me by the neck like this. And I'm just trying to boom, boom, boom. And I just tried to stand up, right? I was I just stand up and shoot this son of a bitch, you know? And as I try to stand up, I grab hold of something to pull myself up, and it came down on his head. Bam! And I was like, oh, fuck. I picked it up and smacked it on his head one more time, you know, and pulled him out from under there, got my gun up, and right as I was pulling the trigger on him, I heard, hey, don't shoot him. We need him. I'm like, I thought we were going to fucking kill this dude. And they were like, no, 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 we need him. Okay, so pulled him up. He was really fucked up, you know. His whole fucking face was fucked up. What, so what did you? What was it that you hit him? A stove. A stove. So. Yeah, the story's better now. And the teams, everybody's like, "Oh, was he taco killed him with a toaster?" I'm like, "There's no toasters in Iraq, but it was a stove, right?" It's a big so, microwave. You know, in America, we bolt the stoves to the wall. Yeah, not over there. So it yeah. came down on his melon, and um, you know why I did it twice? I don't know. You're in the moment, you know. Yeah. So we walked him down the stairs, uh, me and another guy, and uh, we were going to throw him off the fucking roof. So we're walking down from the third story, and the guy's like, hey, let's throw him off. I'm like, let's fucking throw him off. You know, like, fuck this guy. And of course, the Ted Leverage's like, don't fucking throw him off, you idiots. You know, like, yeah. why? You know, like, same reason I same told reason. you not to shoot him. So take him downstairs and uh, put him in the car, and you know, he drives away, never be seen again. But 
Yeah, that was that was it, man. It was uh, probably most one of the most terrifying moments of my life. You know, to be, you know, rolling around the, in the dirt with a, a bad guy, a bad guy who killed a lot of people. Yeah, we know for a fact he killed six Americans. We know for a fact he beheaded two of them. You know, we have the video. And he tortured them and tortured them, them, drilled a drilled a little girl's head full of holes, and he's a piece of shit. You know, yeah. and so that was when you're in that moment, you're just every you, you people are like. This, they, they think you are you we being feeling like i would feel like a hero i was feeling i was scared shitless that's really the reality of it yeah and i'm i was probably screaming screaming for my mom at that moment i don't know i mean i just know that i was like this is bad i'm yeah. alone you know do you do you have any concept of how much time you were hands-on with him maybe a minute yeah it wasn't long would you i mean it sounded like he was a handful but i mean as many he's big he's big dude big strong guy he's hard hard to deal with he did, you know, he's country strong. It wasn't like he was jacked, you know, yeah. he's just, but you know, the, those tall guys, they're just, Lanky, his arm, it was, what it was, his arm and his, you know, my, I got little short, little nubby arms. Right. And I can just remember he was like, I was literally almost standing with his arm around my neck. And that's yeah. the part that was scaring me because I could feel myself starting to turtle. And you know, with all that gear on, you get on your back, yeah. it's bad. Yeah. You know, and like we train, you get on your back, you know, you're not getting off your back. Yeah. And that was my biggest thing was like, and you know, I'm, I'm thankful for Dieter's training, you know, I, I got to participate in a lot of Dieter's training. I just remember telling myself, don't let him, don't go on your back. Yeah. And as a wrestler, I just kept sprawling wider and wider. And but yeah, it was just everything I could bring bringing, bringing the house down on him. You know? Yeah. You know, it's interesting the, the kind of 180 degree turn that there is now, both commercially, societally, uh, well, it's, I guess it's three, three things commercially, societally, and even in the teams combatives wise is so jujitsu heavy now, which, you know, there's a, a lot of things you can do on your back with, you know, X gardens, you know, d- different mechanisms that you can wrap, wrap yourself up into somebody's legs and just absolutely fucking own them from, yeah. from on your back. But at that time that, that wasn't, wasn't much of, of what we were doing. And uh, you, most guys did jujitsu on their own. Like I, I knew how to do it, but it, that was not my, you know, your thought process as a wrestler. I, I become a jujitsu practitioner, yeah. but I was not then. Yes. I was a wrestler. And yes. as a wrestler, you're like, do not get on yeah. your back, you know? No, same here. And, and there's also a little bit of apples to oranges there too. And that there, there are a lot of things that, that I would, you know, f- from a, we'll call it a, a real world or street application now that, that I would probably employ, you know, if, if it was just me dressed how I am, you know, out on the street here, somebody, you know, attacks us at a restaurant or what, you know, whatever, um, th- that is not particularly applicable in an environment like that, depending on the context, you know, what, again, what you're wearing and what they have or don't have, you don't know if he has a gun. I mean, I don't give a fuck how good you are on your back. If a dude's got a gun, forget about it, you know? So th- there's not a, a direct correlation there. And that that's also why one of the things that I do like about the, the Dieter stuff is how simple it is. Like you yeah. don't have to spend nine years, four days a week, to, to get to a point where you could actually use it in an environment like that, where there's that much stress and chaos. Whereas jujitsu, I mean, you, you have to put quite a bit of time into it to be able to really use it uh, in, in my opinion, you know, that's the thing people didn't, you know, that's the part that I never really correlate either is when it was all said and done, there was just shit everywhere. Yeah. Like my comm wires were hanging out, you know, this freaking ma- magazines are half in half out and you know, there's grenade on the floor. I mean, you, you got all that crap on no matter how you secure it. You know, and I, I don't know how, maybe he was grabbing it. I don't know. But like, even my night vision was half kind of bent over the, the mount. Yeah. So it was like, yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and to me, I think, uh, not to get too far off in the weeds and, and I'll, I'll move on after this, but the, I, I think, you know, where jujitsu is really helpful, uh, is in a couple of chokes, a couple of arm bars, a couple of, of leg attacks, you know, j- just a few basic ones. And, and body positioning and working on just that and not looking at it from an MMA or a, a competitive jujitsu standpoint where there's 3,000 different fucking moves. Like to me, that that's not only is it not practical, it's counterproductive because yeah. it's too hard to learn that, that amount of stuff with all of the other shit you have to do. And people ask me that a lot, like how much time did you guys work on combatives? Way less than I think a lot of people think. Because for, for us, I mean, yes, you found yourself in, in a position where you could not get to a gun. You were, you were by yourself with a guy. Of all of the room entries, and, and at this point, there's there's probably hundreds of thousands of them that have taken place just in, in the SEAL teams, let alone special operations. How many of them have ended up like that? A handful, you know? I mean, like, if you find yourself in that position, things have gone so horribly wrong to where, you know, you being able to do some crazy fucking 
you know, octopus style fucking leg yeah. lock on a guy is, is not that, uh, not that high on the priority list when you compare it to being able to be a good shooter, a good communicator, you know, good movement through a house, you know, th- those things are all so much more important than, you know, being able to do certain jujitsu moves that, uh, it, it just, it, it's an order of, of priority. But, um, <clears throat> so when, when, after that happened, were, were there other people in the house? Did, did the mission basically end there where you got him and that was it? Or was, yeah. was there more to it than that? No. So as soon as we got him, we called jackpot and, uh, rolled down to the vehicles and, you know, basically was like, let's get out of here. You know, this city is getting ready, you know, because once you get in there, it's like, it's like going into Sauter city. Once you're in, it, it isn't about, we need to go. It's like, we need to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. It's about to come down on us, you know? Yeah. And so you guys got out of there fairly quick. He gets turned over to Abu Ghraib. You never see him again. And then it wasn't until you got back to where like, so n- nothing. In yeah, so the next morning, um, you know, for us, we woke up at 1 a.m. <coughs> 1 a.m. And uh, I get woke up at like 9 a.m. They're like, Hey man, you need to go in the talk. All right. So I go on the talk, you know, sleep in my eyes, didn't go to bed till like six that morning. And uh, they're like, Hey, you need, you need to fill out a statement. I'm like, what's up? Like, Oh, you killed that dude. So I was like, Oh, okay. So I start fill out my statement, and, you know, basically being as factual as I can. And that statement came on later to obviously save me because I mean, my story never changed. And, um, it turns out later is, you know, as the story progresses is that basically no American doctor to Abu Ghraib would sign the death certificate. They're like, we're not fucking signing that death certificate. So in the photos from Abu Ghraib, he's called the man on ice. So whomever was in the room with him, the civilians were in the room with him, put a fake IV in him, packed him on ice, and the next day pretended to give him chest compressions as they walked him out. They had to go out in town to find an Iraqi doctor. That Iraqi doctor signed a one-line death certificate saying he died of natural causes. Jesus. Yeah. So from, from, I mean, once once there was at least that kind of heads up that something was, was different. Yeah. You had to fill out a statement, statement which you know you hadn't had to do normally. W- was there no indication that that was a problem until after you got home from deployment? I was in Mosul, uh, a deployment later, and the CID guy comes up, you know, Army Criminal Investigations, and like, hey, you need to come up to the talk again. And uh, this guy's there, and I'm like, what's up? He's like, oh, I just wanted to, you know, see if I can get a statement from you. Well, what? He's like, I oh, were investigating you for murder. I'm like, all right, which dude? You know, like. And that's when he's like, this guy, Matt al Jamadi. So that was the first time that I had heard about it. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not giving you a statement. I've already made a statement. And, you know, I'm not making any statements without, you know, proper representation. That's the problem. A lot of military guys don't realize you're, you're, you have rights. You have criminal rights. And I was smart enough to go, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking. So when I came back from deployment, I get called over to WARCOM. And I walk in that room. There's multiple civilians and that CAD guy. And they're like, we want to talk to you about this again. I'm like, well... Last time I would talk, that dude told me I was being investigated for murder. So unless I have a lawyer, I'm not saying anything. And that's when they were like, you are not being investigated. We know exactly what happened. You are not the focus of this. We, we've cleared you of everything. We want to know what you did because we know what happened at Abu Ghraib. I'm like, okay, here's what happened. And then, you know, fast forward another month. And next thing you know, they're like, now we're charging you. I'm like, so... Yeah, I mean, I've had Eddie Gallagher on twice. You know, you. I mean, I've had other guys that that I know or or know guys that know them well. That, that I mean, there are a lot of instances of of our guys. You know, who, in my opinion, you know, put their fucking nuts on the line day in day out and get just fucking steamrolled by yeah. by the Navy and by our government, and it, it's fucking terrible. I mean, you know, it's an all volunteer force, and then you get these fucking trigger happy prosecutor based idiots that just like in the, in the civilian sector, and this is a big problem I have with our criminal justice system is, is using the the conviction rate as like the EBITDA of a business would, you know, is, is that that's the value of you as a, as a, uh, you know, you know, uh, prosecutorial attorney is, is, well, what's your conviction rate? And and like, to me, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be what makes you a good fucking attorney or not. I mean, I I get where that stems from, but, but that incentivizes guys to convict people no matter what, you know? And so they, they stop caring about what's right and, and start and only caring about their ability to, to convict people at, at the highest percentage rate possible. And I just, I think that's such a flawed, flawed way to go about it, uh, especially in the military when it's like, you know, I'm sure that, that their uh, ability to promote and, and uh, their award-based system is, is 
centered around that and, and drives them to do that. But it's just, it's such a fucking backwards poisonous way to go about it. And it's tragic too, because, you know, one of the guys who got charged with me was an EOD guy mm. and a young kid, you know, uh, it's such a special place in my heart for him. He actually died later on. He admitted to doing things and I'm like, you weren't even there. Yeah. I'm like you weren't even in the vehicle. I'm like, well, he's like, dude, I, I, I don't know. Like it was, and he was in 19 hours, you know, of an interview didn't know that he could have say stop, didn't know that he could have the right to an attorney. And by the end of the, by the end of the interview, you know, and you're talking, you know, people like, how did that guy, you know, like, how did that guy confess? And this is a guy who's a special operations EOD guy who deployed with us twice, squared away, who basically said he might as well have killed the Pope. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, you weren't even there. Wow. And literally, I'm reading, you know, because I got, I got the discovery. And I'm, I'm, I was just baffled, like, why would you even admit you, you weren't there? He's like, I don't even know what, what happened. And that's the part that was just tragic, you know. And he, when he got killed, you know, a couple of years later, about a year and a half later, Ramadi, it, it was just like, it, it, that, that one probably, of all the things that happened, that probably hurt the worst because the last conversation we had with each other wasn't a good conversation. Yeah. You know, and, and I loved him. And I, you know, and, and, and it still makes me sad because we were very close. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. That's tough. Um, were there, I mean, you did multiple deployments to, um, to that area of operations. Um, <clears throat> were, were there any other missions that, uh, kind of stand out as being notable in that same regard, not necessarily going hands on, but just from, from an actions at the objective standpoint were, were notable. <laughs> Yeah, okay. you know, in Mosul, we got to do it, just so many missions. It was ridiculous. One of them stands out, and it's it's a funny story, but, like, it's probably the most emotional story for me. You know, not, not, not talking about the gunfights, whatnot. This was, this was everything that can go wrong goes wrong, but it turns out in the end, you're just like, oh, my God. And so we're, we're outside the city called Telefar, and it's they're getting ready to, you know, go through Telefar, and, and basically our big army is going to go through Telefar and battle it up. So we're going to go hit this target, massive compound. We know there's probably, you know, 25, 30 guys in this compound. It's a staging point. So it's us, the Grom, and uh, ODA team. And so we launched on this, this target, and, and it's huge. It's probably, you know, 100, 150 room target. It looks like a hotel. And so as we're rolling up there, the one, I'm already mad because, you know, Ron Culpepper, who was my, my, my SEA, and I love Ron, Ron's like, hey, man, you know, you should talk to this breacher. He's been working out here a lot, and he says you should use this certain charge. I'm like, I'm not using that charge. Like, it's going to take three of us to employ. It's called a submarine charge. So it's six IV bags across a T-bar, and you're going to put that against these gates. And so during the brief, they were like, hey, what are you going to do if, the, if you can't breach the gate? Because, you know, all the gates are big, but they always have a door. I'm like, I want to breach the door, obviously. Well, you know, these are big steel gates, and I don't think the charge you're going to use – I'm like, dude, I've done this 300 times. I know this charge is going to work, and, and I teach breaching. So, of course, Ron makes me do this thing, and the guy's like, what are you going to do if the charge doesn't work? I'm like, I'm going to drive the vehicle, the 12,000-pound vehicle, right through those gates. Oh, that'll never work. So it's already contentious, right? <laughs> Army versus Navy, you know. Yeah. It's their battle space. We're the first one. We're the first SEALs to go in their battle space. And, the, you know, the, I don't think they wanted us there. They needed us because the target was so big. So, of course, as we're driving up to the target, lights everywhere, and it was supposed to be us hitting first, you know, completely by ourselves, and then helicopters come into support, and then the, then the Bradleys and the, and the strikers and everybody come in. Of course, that never happens. So as we're pulling up to the target, we're at our staging point, I'm rigging the charge, and it's in my lap like this big, all right? And we start going down this long causeway, and it's probably a mile-long causeway with the target to the end of this causeway. Here comes the helicopter, boom, 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 boom. and I'm like are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> you know, so we're sitting there and, you know, for us in Mosul, once the, once the breach was set, I pretty much for the most part had control. Really, I took control when my feet hit the ground, but as we're driving up, I had the authority to call avalanche or tuna, 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 right? And so avalanche is if you're taking gunfire, let's get out of here. If tuna, tuna, we're compromised. So we're driving up there. As the helicopter goes over, buzzes the target. And like four dudes are sitting there looking at the helicopter and then they see us and I'm like, tuna, tuna, tuna. Just go. So Benji, you know, I can't say his real name. He, he's, he's a damn neck now. I think he's retired. He guns it. We blast through that gate. The gate turns into 27 pieces, right? Yeah. The gunner in the vehicle, too, who also went to damn neck, throws a big concussion grenade over the root, over the wall, and bam, it goes off. And dudes, by the time we go in, there's dudes dancing. 
crashes are going off all through this compound. You know, guys, you literally guys are dancing. It's so funny. And so we had broken up into sections. And so my section, the breach section, we saw a staircase. We're going to that staircase and we're going across this roof line. In the video, in the photos, what we thought was a machine gun nest was pointing directly out of a window on the second deck. Like we have to get to that thing quick because if anybody mans it, we're screwed. So as we're going down the second deck, you know, at full speed, and we're all speared up, right? I just see Rob Reeves, God rest his soul, and Eric Moeller, I see their heads whip back. And they're, boom, they're on the ground. And I'm like, fuck, where's he at? Where's he at? You know, and I'm now I'm mad. I'm like, ah, you're, I'm going to fucking kill you, you know? And I can't see anybody. I'm just, go, go, go. We go up to that room, and I just pulled a concussion grenade. I'm like, and I, I probably, I'm glad I didn't throw a frag, but I pulled a concussion grenade, and boom, massive explosion. Go in there and clear, nothing. And I hear clear right, and I hear clear left. I'm like, I recognize those voices. And I turn my head, and I turn my head, I turn my head back to Robbie and Robbie's like clothesline. <laughs> right? And you know, I'm five foot eight and Robbie was about five foot 10 and, and Eric's about six foot. And so oh, the clothesline had great. caught their night vision, whipped their heads back. And in that moment, Mike, I, I just uh, cried like a little bitch, bro. I just funny. broke down crying. Really? Oh, they're my guys, man. Oh, I gotcha. They're yeah. my guys, you know? And, and I just, I thought they were dead. Yeah. And I remember just crying and Rob Reeves like, you pussy. You know? I'm like, I'm like, dude, and I was just, just sitting there. I'm getting a little emotional now. Think about it. Right. I just crying and over the radio, like, Hey, we need to breach team up to the front gate. Okay. Back in the game. Right. So go to the front gate, go up to this, <laughs> go up to this front gate. And we called the coffee shop from the photos and <clears throat> Dan Healy, he's an officer. He's throwing crashes and blowing the windows out of this building. I'm like, what's up? He's like, there's a dude in there. Okay, let's go up there. So I go up there and put a charge to the door. The door isn't closed. And I literally fall flat on my face. <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> Luckily, it was, it was like a shoe room. So I go up, there's another door. Same exact thing. I go and put the charge to the door. <laughs> Boom, I fall flat on my face. And everybody rushes in. They're like, you could, you could hear them laughing. Yeah. They're laughing at me. Like, you stupid moron, you know? <laughs> and so you're half blind already. So we go up there and we get online. And it's a big room, long room. There's a big pile of carpets in the middle. And, you know, we're all gunned up and... Like, all right, let's go up here. And, we get, and all of a sudden, the cart moves. Like, hey, there's a dude in there. And this is a time of the war. Where we're not just shooting to shoot, right? We're very, got a positive ID, everybody. And so I'm like, hey, grab those blankets, pull the blankets off, and we'll, you know, we'll go, de we'll deal with it. So, I, you know, remember those C cups? Yeah. So I C cut my weapon, pull the blankets off, and there's a dude there, and I just <clears> jump on him. And in his hands, he, he, I basically got my hands around his hands. And, you know, you're in such an adrenaline mode. I swear to you, I felt something steel in his hand. And I'm like, he's got a grenade. And I'm like, shoot him, shoot him. Well, they're not going to shoot him with me right there. So they're just muzzle striking the piss out of this dude, right? Beating the shit out of him. And finally, like, he kind of kind of knocks him out or whatever and pull his hands apart. He's literally holding a spoon. Holy fuck. So this dude's getting the piss kicked out of him over a spoon, right? Jesus. So we get done with that. I'm like, Oh, uh, you know, you, you just, you go from this one terrifying moment to another terrifying moment, you know, and to relief, to terrifying, to relief, and to sitting there again, they're like, Hey, again, the radio comes and you know, we're on, this is a long target. We need a breach team. Like okay, come out and like, you know, the mission commander, uh, Joe Bazzelli, he's like, Hey, I need you guys to go up on the roof and go across the roof and go down in that compound next door. I'm like, that's the SS compound. He's like, yeah, they can't get in. What the fuck you mean? They can't get in. He's like, they can't get in. So we go over this roof and it's probably a, you know, I, maybe it's eight feet drop, but you know, with goggles on pitch black, it looks like a 20 foot drop. And I remember Eric, Eric, I just call him Eric. Cause he's a damn neck. I'm like, you're tallest. You go first. <laughs> he's like, fuck it, taco. Yeah. So it goes down the roof and you just hear this. Buff. <laughs> he's like, he's like, it's cool. There's nothing down there. I'm like, all right, new guy. So I come down and it, it's a longer mm -hmm. fall for me. And boom, I land. I'm like, Ugh. so we get in there. It's a sheep pen. So as we're going through the sheep pen, there's these little tunnels. We go through there, and there's a family in there. Like a full-on family in this sheep-shitted tunnel. So we're, we're sitting there. I'm like, hey, fuck, don't shoot these guys. You know, I pull the guy aside. I'm like, search him up real quick. Throw the green chem light. I'm like, hey, don't fucking shoot these guys. And we keep going, clear their target, and then come up, and we hear, boom, breaching charge go off. Get ready to hear another one, boom, another breaching charge. So I grab the, the bundle of blue chem lights and throw it over the wall. I'm like, blue, blue, blue. Like, hey, I'm opening the door. It's us on the other side of the door. And so I go up there and it's drop bar. All right. I pull the drop bar, pull the pin, and the SF breacher who I had had a little confrontation with, I look at him, I go, drop pin. <laughs> Turn around and 
That was probably one of the funniest ones. I got a lot of shit for that. Obviously, they're like, "You rubbed it in his face." I'm like, "Of course yeah. I did." You know. So, and uh, he ended up turning to be a really good guy. They, 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 uh, they those guys were, were squared away. Those yeah. SF dudes, they, they, they fought a lot great. of war up there. So, well, how how long do you think this whole thing took? That was at least an hour. Oh shit! Yeah, we were on target for a long time. I mean, wow. you got to think the whole the whole town, which was right outside Telefar, we took the entire town out. Yeah. So all the striker guys, I think there was like 18 strikers. Probably four or five Bradleys. They even had, I think, two or three Abrams out there. You know, multiple helicopters, a whole stack of aircraft. Yeah. Four assault teams. Wow. So. Um, to, to me, the hearing you walk through that story kind of highlights the, you know, what you see in, in TV shows and movies of how things go and then how they really go. You know, where there's shit that happens that's, you know, like expect the unexpected. You know, things happen, that whether it's clotheslining and you think they're shot or mistaking a spoon for a fucking grenade or you know you're so amped up and you and you go through this just whirlpool of emotions um you know in a very short period of time and and then the level of that emotion you know is as high as as it can be you know in, internally that way and, and it's just i think it really kind of speaks volumes to just how uh, stressful and chaotic and and tough of an environment that our guys go go out into day in day out in, in those types of environments and, and just how hard it is on guys because that you know that, that's hard to to comprehend and wrap your mind around um you know in in that in that moment seeing and, and doing those things and having all of those different things happen in that order is uh i mean it's fucking mind-numbing it's funny right you know so johnny walker um, codenamed Johnny Walker. He's got a bunch, you know, book. Yeah, he's whatever. been on here. So Johnny and I were in Mosul together. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you go through these emotions. We were just talking about this the other day, but like, you know, my son, who I've never fostered this environment that I want you to go in the teams. Yeah. I've always told them, I don't want you to go. I want you to live boring lives, doctors and lawyers and such, you know, like dad fought enough war for everybody. And, you know, my youngest son now has decided, hey, I want to train for it. And even though I'm not... I'm not thrilled. I'm like I'll, I'll train you. Yeah. If you're going to do it, I'll help you. You know, I'm 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 not going to re- hold you back. This is I get it. Uh, yeah. I was that I was there too. But I sat there with him the other day, and I and I was very honest with him. You know, I'm like, this isn't a movie. Yeah. When the movie ends, you throw your popcorn in the trash and you go home. You know, in Mosul, we would go until literally, you know, Commander Bazelli was like, we're going to take a day off, guys. That's how much shit we were doing. And you, you, it, and you take those days off. And I remember being in Baghdad, you're like, oh, we just want a mission, we want a mission, we want a mission. In Mosul, we were like, man, I just want a day off. Yeah. Like you just so beat up. You know, for us, we were the brown man team. So we're out during the daytime getting video, you know, in ditch cars, walking the streets, and then come back, have to lead the guys out to the target that night. And I remember those days off, you're like, you, you just like, fuck, you know, and I'm trying to explain this to my son. And then I remember when they were like, hey, we're, we're done. We were out on a mission. We came back, and we're, we're, we're getting set up to go do four more. And they're like, hey, man, we're done. We're done. And I remember just, we're, we're in, the, you know, in, the, in the team room, and everybody's just like, you just see everybody's like, because <clears throat> it was just so real. Like, it was just so, like, and nobody was like, oh, bummer. Yeah. It was like, oh, fucking thank God. I think we're going to live. Yeah. It's you know, a fucking we, huge relief. Yeah. I think yep. we did close to 200 DAs up there. Wow. We were doing four and eight a night and it was just go, go. And we were the first, you know, basically door kickers to show up in Mosul after Uday and Kuse. Nobody had been up there, but thought it was a peaceful city. It turns out it was just a massive staging ground. And you know, obviously you see what happened to Mosul the years to come. Yeah. But, um, and I'm trying to explain this like, Hey man, when this movie is over, you get to go home. This, this movie doesn't end. Yeah. It's just, you just go home, reload your mags and go back out and do it again. Did that no. seem to resonate with him at his age or? Yeah, you know, and he's only ever been around SEALs. You know, like I've trained 37 kids. They all have tridents, you know, and uh, during the gyms and then in my garage and now online. And so my son, my oldest son, his three roommates are all SEALs. And, you know, my best friends are all SEALs, the uncles. So that's all my youngest son has ever known. And so I, I get it. And, you know, he's heard, he's heard the stories. You know, obviously I used to be a big drinker. So when you drink, the stories come out and, Sometimes they're, they're definitely not PG. And um, I think he gets it of all people. And I can't I can't be upset for him cho- wanting to choose that path of life because he is such a wonderful young man. You know, obviously when you grow up in Bellevue, Washington, Bellevue's very liberal. 
you know, the teachers would call like, you know, your son was the only one to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. And so things like that, like resonate. And I'm like, and for me, I'm, I'm trying to talk him in and go special forces reserve. Like, Hey, you're going to get all the same training, but you get to come home. And if, if something happens, you're all going to go. But this way you're not in there every day. You're not going to be away from your girlfriend. You're not going to be away from your family. You know, you, you get to come home and you get to go do some good training with great dudes. A lot of my friends are, spe- you know, special force reserve guys. And, um, no, he's like, I want to yeah. be a team guy. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, fuck it, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> chip, chip off the old block. <laughs> yeah, oh. That's fucking classic. You know, he's a incredible athlete. You yeah. know, it's one thing all three kids are just, they got yeah. mom's genes. Mom was a great athlete. So. Yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, their dad was, was pretty, uh, pretty legit too, but I don't think we have, I mean, I don't think, I, I know we never were at the same team at the same time, so I never, never did any morning PTs with you, but, uh, but you have a reputation for being, uh, you know, may, maybe a little above average, even in the SEAL community. So. I, 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 had, I had some moments yeah, before yeah. the injuries. I was, uh, I was quite the fast guy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know it. I do a lot of things. Yeah. Well, that, and I mean, you know, using a, using a stove the way that you did, <laughs> uh, that, that takes a certain uh, skill set too, I think, uh, or, or level of competency. But, um, <clears throat> When uh, when you saw all of the things that were going on in Mosul, after we kind of pulled back and you saw ISIS just steamroll through there, can you tell me what uh, what did that do to you seeing that? Oh, it was just so sad, man. Like, if one thing I can be proud of is we we were had we stayed another month, we would have broke their back. You know, Team Two came in to relieve us, and if Team Two would have been allowed to stay there, they would have. If, broke the back of the enemy, right? Because we had them reeling. Like, we, we, we were, they, we, they, they feared us. Like, they'd see, like, we got to Mosul, nobody would move their cars out of the way. By the time we left, people were, like, pulling off the sides of the roads, like, them crazy some bitches are coming through. And that's yeah. back when we were in open vehicles, right? Yeah. And Team 2 showed up, and we had them a stack of targets, like, here you go, go wreak some havoc. We were there for two weeks during the turnover, taking them on missions, and, you know, it was, it was like, okay, it's, it's getting real. Like, there's, there's, it's, they're waiting for us. However, they're scared, right? And then as soon as Team 2 arrived, they're there for a week, and then they got the presidential security details, and yeah. that was the end of the teams in Mosul for a few years. And then I think uh, Team 7 ended up going back again, getting in some really big pitch battles, and then ended again. And uh, to see ISIS just go there, and I remember watching the video of them stacking the Iraqi police guys along the river and just shooting them all day long, all day long, right? And just bodies falling in the river. I remember just sitting there going, fuck, man, we could have won that thing. You know? Yeah. Was there any, any part of you that thought, what, what was the fucking point? Yeah. You know, I went through some, some moments like that. Um, I, I've been through, you know, many different emotions. Like, you know, what would I do if you invaded America? Of course I'd fight, you know, because I know that we fought guys there who were probably just patriotic to their cause. I also know we fought a lot of shitheads. Yeah. Um, I went through a pretty dark period of, what was the point? And then, you know, I've, I've come to a point now where I was there for, you know, like, you know, the comment, I was there for my bros and I, and I know what I did while I was there was good. And I know I helped people. I got to see kids play soccer in the streets. You know, I got to see the number of attacks decrease dramatically. You know, we have the awards to prove what we did. Um, so I'm proud of that, that for a brief moment in time, I was able to help people in those, in those, in Mosul live a more peaceful life, you know, yeah. Looking at it from kind of the 30,000 foot view now, you know, years, years after the fact, what are your thoughts on, uh, on our involvement in Iraq as a whole? Um, probably a very unpopular, what I'll say is I'm, um, I'm very big on isolations now. I think we should focus on this country. If people invade this country, you fucking stack them up like cordwood and let the dogs get fat on them. But as far as going over those countries, it, it, it I'm not, I, I don't support it, Yeah, you know, and it isn't because I don't believe that these are freedom and their rights It's because these cowards in charge yeah. um, are spineless. You know, I got to see George Bush release 500 guys we captured because of some photos. And it's like those guys that got captured at Abu Ghraib got released and went and killed all of our sources, you know, on video. And I sit there, I'm like, you're the president of the United States. Have a gross sack, man. Like you sent us there to go freaking do this. Support it. Yeah. And you know, this, this, this guy in charge now, I'm like, it's just an embarrassment. I mean, it's just purely an embarrassment. Right. 
And I, I, with people like that sitting at the highest levels of uh, as flag officers, as politicians, all you're going to do is kill Americans. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that's going to happen. Yeah. You're going to send Americans over there and everybody's like, we got to go support. And like, you're just going to kill them. They're going to go over there just like Somalia, no gunships, no Bradleys, one hand tied behind their back. That's the administration you have right now today, just like Vietnam. You know, there was a brief moment in time in Iraq where the gloves came off and um, then the gloves went back on. Yeah. You know, and that's sad to me, you know, and I'm sure you've had Jocko on here before and I know how he feels about it. And I, I ha- he has actually has not been uh, on this show. Oh, okay. I thought he, he had, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's agree- well, he should be. He's, oh. agree- he's agreed to come on. Uh, getting him actually to... To sit in that fucking seat is another story, uh, schedule wise. But um, you mentioned it's probably an unpopular opinion. I believe that um, that 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 opinion that you just espoused is uh, far more popular than you think. And I would say my opinion on it is that I don't disagree with a single thing that you said. You know, and, and I think a lot of guys are that way. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> um, for the guys, you know, for for those that have actually been there and, and done that and got their hands dirty on behalf of Uncle Sam and have lost uh, some of the best men that we will ever know to those causes, you know, we're obviously all willing uh, to, to do that, to potentially have to sacrifice ourselves or, or be okay with, with our countrymen uh, doing the same, but it needs to be for a just reason. And uh, I think most times it's not, you know, or it's, or it's so, confused with what just is and, and the way that it's um executed is um it really kind of uh, soils the the justification of doing it you know you know and that's the thing is having a having a, a person who is very close to me who is an iraqi citizen now an american citizen you know spending hours upon hours of him learning the culture and understanding you know the the arab mind the arab male only understands two things it's power and violence he who's the most violent is the most powerful. And so removing a person of power in the Arab world, you know, it's already been all over the news, it creates a vacuum, and what replaces it is many more pow- pieces of power, none of which agree. Yeah, Their feuds are a 1,000 years old. And, you know, they if, their culture is a culture that we're trying to put our values in their culture, and we're, we're, they laugh at us. Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I've yeah. used this kind of analogy on, on more than one occasion on on various shows but to me it's it's no different than you know say china deciding hey this whole christian-based democracy thing isn't really panning out the way we want it to in america so we're gonna replace it with a buddhist-based communist government and uh that should pan out well like you and i'll be masked assholes running around fucking sniping people and blowing up fucking chinese vehicles and, and whatever the same way that any of the countries that we've been in, uh, you know, have, have responded the same way. You know, I, I don't understand why there, there's such a sense of arrogance um, within our country or within our government's policy makers that way. Um, you know, our, our government is, uh, is just on the wrong fucking track so many times that oh. way, you know, and, and I'd love to get C- fucking Crenshaw on here. I, I've invited him on here. He, you know, I'm not going to say he won't come on, but he sure as fuck hasn't. Uh, I'd love to sit sit down and and actually push back and and say, hey, what's the fucking deal with this? You know, like why are are you know people in your position, including yourself, making the amount of fucking money that you're making while you're in that position as a public servant? It's fucking bullshit. I'm not saying you shouldn't be able to make money. Of of course I'm I'm okay with that. But when most of them, fucking all of them. When they go in versus when they come out, their net worth is you know 10x what it was when they went in. It's not a fucking coincidence. No. It's not a fucking accident. You know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have Eli Crane on who's running for Congress. Uh, he just hooked me up the other day, by the way. <laughs> good. I, I've had him on before. He's a fucking great guy. I, I, I love him. Uh, and I can't wait to have him sit down to ask him some of those same things. Say, hey, like, what, what are you going to do about that? Anything? Can you do anything yeah. about it? Like, what's your position on it? You know, don't, don't you think something, you know, I, there's a lot of fucking things that I can't wait to ask him because, um, you know, to me, there, there's there's before you go there, and then there's after, and, and trying to get anybody that once they're there to, to come sit on the in the hot seat and fucking answer any questions, you can't get them to do it. And again, I don't think that's a fucking coincidence either. Um, you know, so uh, it's just the whole thing seems really fucking broken to me. But um, at any rate, uh, moving on to obviously you had um, 
you know, a, a, a bad taste in your mouth as it relates to, to the Navy and government service. Uh, you see the, the carrot of the, the contractor paycheck. Um, you end up getting out and going, going and doing that. I know there's a fair bit that you can't really talk about on that, but for, for what you can share, if you could kind of talk about your time doing that. Uh, the contractor con- the contractor or stuff. Uh, awesome. I mean, that it, it, to me, that was the best experience of how war should be fought ever. Yeah. You know, in country for 60 days, home for 60 days, here is your target. Here is your mission. Here is all the assets we can throw in your direction. Go. Yeah. And your oversight is what you decide to share with us. Yeah. That was literally it. Like your oversight is what you decide to share. Okay. And it was, and to be part of a hand selected group of, of guys, you know, that program is really big now. Right. When I was there, it was only 12 guys. And, um, it's Did funny. You go through with Glenn and Ty. Huh? No, no, they were on, they were on the, the another side of the program. Okay. I was way before them. Yeah. Um, that's how big the program had gotten though. Yeah. So, but it was, it was awesome to be, have such clear delineation and then have the guy who was leading the program was just the epitome of a warrior. And he was an old Delta guy. You know, he, 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 he was, he yeah. was a rock star. Man. Real deal. He was, he was all about his men, you know, <laughs> like there were no, there was no gray about how yeah. you, how he, you are going to act around his men. Yeah. You know, and it was awesome. Were there any, uh, I know the, the mission set, you know, in terms of, of what you guys are there doing is vastly different, but you end up in some pretty similar circumstances. Are there any gunfights or, or hairy sticky situations that you can share without giving too much detail away? Yeah. You know, the, 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 the tricky part is you're embedded, right? So there's two of you and embedded with, a, with a local fighting force, you know, a very highly vetted local fighting force. But you, you definitely have one eye open. Yeah. Right. And then you get into these situations where there's a communication barrier and now you're in a gunfight in a place where you're like, one, we're on a side of a border where we're not supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. They say they'll come get you. Yeah. <laughs> so until uh, they don't, there, 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 there was, there was one where it was, uh, Save, put the last bullet in your shirt pocket and save it for you. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was one of those moments. And yeah. it's funny, one of, one of my bros, he was part of TFO. He and I talk about it. And uh, he's like, yeah, man, it was, it, it, it's funny when you sit with another guy and you don't really share things, right? You sit with another guy and he's like, yeah, man, I thought we were all done. And I'm like, dude, I thought we were all done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Fucking big relief. <laughs> what, uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the, uh, like, the vehicles that you're driving in and like, like, budget wise it's kind of a fucking blank checkbook i mean there's some pretty cool shit that you get to roll with right yeah so you know we had you know the g the, for for company vehicles you had g wagons but when normally we'd go grab indige vehicles yeah so we go out in town buy vehicles and then rig them all up you know put the pieces uh, devices in there and we, we'd screw the circuitry to where we could if we were being a follow or being followed you could turn one light on turn one light off turn a headlight on turn a headlight off if you're following somebody do the same sequence so that way they don't look in the review and see the same things have uh communication devices on those vehicles that are satcom but low visibility have you know um fireflies on there to where the helicopters and the drones can see us but nobody else can see us that was really cool stuff right yeah. having radios that are now you know coming into the to to regular soft units that were highly capable radios but very very small you know yeah. um that was that was some cool stuff in, in some of those vehicles are you doing engine work and up armor type stuff also or um we tried to for the most part though it, it, the, if you did too much the suspension would give you away yeah right so a lot of it was put blankets where you need to put blankets it really you came to rely on just your disguise yeah. you know for me i just dress up and try to be a big fat iraqi or a big fat pakistani <laughs> or a big fat <laughs> afghani you know like put my body armor on and put a shirt over the top and yeah. there's some johnny walker just posted a photo and you can see me i have this you know mustache and everybody's like dude what's up with the stash i'm like well, i can't grow a beard yeah right so i just had the stash and i would just like okay make yourself look like a big fat iraqi oh, you know make sure you're a big fat pakistani you know well i mean that's the thing like you know you versus me over there like you're gonna get i disappear in, in, a, in places you know way better than my fucking yeah, blue, blue-eyed ass with the crew do. that i had you know like one of the guys it's funny his family is career dark side guys 
Yeah. He's a SEAL. His dad was a dark side guy. His brother is a dark side guy. Now Sounds he's... racist, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, it, when Joe would put his, when Joe would grow a beard and put his, his gear on, there's times where I almost shot Joe. <laughs> like, bro. <laughs> <laughs> like, who the fuck? <laughs> yeah, who let you in here? Yeah, there, you know, you know yeah. you, you, it comes with a certain, you know, name. You know, you're a Gomez, you're a Sanchez, yeah. you're a Lopez, you yeah. know? Yeah. So. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and I guess, you know, if you like over there, that's, that's for sure the case. When you think about what's going on now, like situations like that, then a guy like me is probably going to blend in a little better if, you know, yeah, if it's you Ukraine. Know, I, or Russia, I can't whatever. go to Uzbekistan and work, you know, in Dig. Yeah. <clears throat> you can, you disappear. You just, yeah. you're one of the dudes, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, all right. So at, at what point did you decide the contracting gig has been good, but I'm done. And now I want to kind of uh, jump into, into the civilian sector. Completely and totally by accident. Really? So my boss, um, he was in charge of the whole program. I was had no idea he had left, right? So I get a phone call one day. He's like, hey, man, I need you in Seattle on Monday. And I'm like, can I be there Wednesday? I just got home. He's like, okay, Wednesday. So I show up on Wednesday and show up to C- SeaTac Airport. And like in the whole like brevity, like, hey, man, I need you to wear a red hat. I need you to stand by Carousel 3. <laughs> I'm like, okay, all right, cool. You know, you get, you get you're used to those things, right? Yeah. And so I'm sitting there. I look to my right. I'm like, Eric, he's like, Taco, what's up? I'm like, what you doing here, man? He's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm here for that thing. You here for that thing? He's like, I'm here for that thing. I'm like, <laughs> okay. I'm like, well, what are we doing? He's like, I don't know. Yeah. Because you, know, you don't get read in until you arrive, right? Yeah. And so there's this dude walking back and forth, goatee, bald head. And I'm like, I bet you this motherfucker's looking for us. Yeah. And Creepy's like, no way. I'm like, he is, dude. Look at him. He yeah. looks like a contractor, right? Yeah. So he's walking by, whatever. And and by, by the way, we don't do that. We don't bald. We're no bald head goatee guys. Yeah. We're you try to look like a civilian. You know, you yeah. try to disappear. So finally, he's, I'm like, hey, bro, you looking for me? You looking for us? And he's like. John has a long mustache. I'm like, the grass is green. Motherfucker, it's us, dude. Let's go, right? <laughs> so get in the vehicle, take your fingerprints, uh, you know, check IDs, whatever. Hey, w- what's going on? He's like, can't talk to you. Can't tell you. This guy's playing so, a role, huh? Yeah. So we go cruise around and, you know, obviously I've been to Seattle a hundred times. So I'm like, why are we going this way? We go all the way into Seattle and then across the I-90 bridge into Mercer Island. Hey, why don't we just go up the 405? But you don't say anything. You're the new guy, right? Let's so go d- all the way down through Mercer Island to the very back. And there's a QFC over there, which is like a safe way, right? So go to the back of the QFC. He's like, get out, stay here. Somebody will come get you. I'm like, all right. So we're sitting there. I'm like, okay, chilling. Van pulls up. What's your name? I'm like, oh, here's my name. Let me see your passport ID. Boom, biometrics. Okay, get in the vehicle. All blacked out van. I'm like, all right. You know, guys in a uniform. I'm like, cool. I'm like, okay. Drive down. Next thing you know, you come out of this big, beautiful estate. I'm like, God dang, man government knows how to do this shit bro look at this yeah. place like this is like multi-million dollar estate right like park and get out and go down that path there's a house at the end of this path like all right so i'm dragging my little roller bag the green roller bag we got <laughs> five or whatever, i'm dragging this roller bag uh, go to this house and as soon as i walk in the house it's like cheer walking in cheers taco oh no shit so in that room is jimbo hine sean mcbride grand all my bros like what are you guys doing here? They're like, we're, we're here for that thing. I'm like, what, what's the thing? I'm like, what kind of body armor we got? What kind of weapons we got? Like, where are we going? Go to North Korea? What are we doing? They're like, nah, dude. We're guarding little fat kids. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. no. <laughs> like, no, where are we going? We're going to China? Like, what are we doing? Like, what's up? They're like, no, dude. We're guarding little fat kids. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, uh, we're going to guard Paul Allen's niece and nephews. I'm like, who's Paul Allen? Like, co-founder of Microsoft. I'm like, Bill Gates? Like, no, no, the other guy. I'm like, yeah. the other guy? <laughs> There's Who another the fuck guy? is the other guy? They're like, <laughs> oh, this guy, like, he left even before they got big. I'm like, okay. So it turns out he had, like, $27 billion. Yeah. And uh, they wanted to upgrade their security in the, in the way that a couple of other families, prominent families, had done it by going through special, using special operations guys. My boss had gotten recruited by the biggest security firm in the world, to become the president of the American section of it and decided to bring all of us with him. Oh, shit. And so we showed up there and they were like, here you go and here's how much you're going to get paid. I'm like, you're going to pay me this to watch little fat kids on a playground. <laughs> and I'm like, and first off, I was like, and they were like, okay, here's the teams. I'm like, why can't I be on the travel team? They're like, you have kids, don't you? I'm like, yeah, like those dudes don't have kids. Yeah. Like, so if you have kids, you're going to be on the kids team. I'm like, but I got my own kids. I don't want to like watch other people's kids. So by virtue of having kids, I got put on yeah. the kids. I, I almost think it should be the opposite. It's it like, if you be. have kids, stay the fuck away yeah. from there. So you're uh, be like I ended up being, becoming uh, uh, Manny, 
yeah. for essentially six years <laughs> oh, of yeah. guarding little rich fat kids, which were awesome kids. I loved yeah. them. Yeah. I got very, very close to them. And uh, They called you Manny? <laughs> no, they called me Taco. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and oh you said Nanny. No, Man- Manny. Oh, what? Nanny? Oh, I man. got you. I so, got you. Here, um, here I am fucking trying to keep up. Yeah, Kate Kay Courtley played one in a movie one time. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, I got to go. And it was it was great. You know, the 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 environment sucked because I'd never been around corporate America before. Yeah. Never been around the backstabbing and all that jazz. Yeah. But the what we did there was spectacular. We got to go to every notable event known to mankind. And we got to do it in a way that was completely team guy. Like, hey, we're going to the Super Bowl next week. I'm like, okay, who do I call? We don't know. Figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah. Like, oh, by the way, we need a helicopter to land. Like how do you do that? I don't know. Figure it out. So it was literally like, here you go. Yeah. Academy Awards. Here you go. You're yeah. like, Ugh. that's the best way to do it. It was the best way. Yeah. And you know, when you do, I did seven Super Bowls. I was the lead for seven Super Bowls and NBA all-star games, Academy of War, Cannes Film Festivals, these long trips to Africa. You're talking, you know, seven, eight countries in Africa, 27 yeah. aircraft, yachts, helicopters. It, it was awesome. I learned so much, yeah. you know? So, I, I mean, I've got a million fucking questions on that stuff. The, uh, the, the two that come to mind primarily is that when you go overseas and even, I guess, in this country, but especially overseas from a, a being armed standpoint, like some of these places you're going to want to be armed, right? But I'm assuming most places you can 99% of the time we're unarmed. Even here? Yeah. Really? Um, because, you know, you get into a position where as a SEAL, you're a gunfighter. As an executive protection guy, you're an eye fighter. All right. That's really the definitive is I need to fight with my eyeballs. I need to see it happening before it ever happens and in the situation and move my principle. Because if I draw my gun, I have failed. Because yeah. now I'm, I'm in a pistol fight. A pistol is, you know, people are like, oh, I'm like, a pistol is useless, right? It's a seven meter weapon. And at seven meters, it's a 50-50 battle. Now with me, it's a probably 90-10 battle because I'm a great pistol shot. However, if I'm occupied with that pistol, I'm occupied on that target, not what's around me. I can transition... But my job is to get this principle moving. And so that's your biggest fight. And what we found was we could be armed, but that being armed ends up slowing you down. If you're going through metal detectors at a Super Bowl, yeah. you're not a cop, right? So what we would do is we'd hire cops. Okay, if we need arms, we need people to get in gunfights. Let's hire those local assets. Yeah. So you're hiring that local cop. You're hiring that local driver. Anybody, you know, if you wanted the big blue bodyguards to look apart, you hire them. Yeah. You're the executive protection guy. Really, you're not even protection. You're more support. So it's almost like you're the fucking quarterback. Really. You're the quarterback. Yeah. And what we would do is we handled everything. So for our principal, it was restaurants. It was hotels. It was his cars, his flights. It was his walking his dog. It was your term to executive protection, really is executive support. And that's the way I market it today is we make our executives' lives faster and we can protect you. Yeah. But in the reality of the world of this is you got a lot of guys who spend a lot of time training on firearms training. I'm like, Okay, and they train on secret service tactics. I'm like, there's never going to be four of you. Yeah. And there's probably, you, you, if you ever see a diamond in the civilian world, that's probably some, that's a millionaire, not a billionaire. Billionaires don't want that. Yeah. Billionaires don't even want to see you. They want covert protection. They want guys who are invisible. They want to know that if you're standing next to them, there's a problem or something's going on. Yeah. Outside of that, they know you're at that corner and you know they're at that corner. And that's where you learn to fight with your eyeballs. Yeah. You learn to read the room, eyes, hands, feet, eyes, hands, feet, eyes, hands, feet. Where's my exits? Where's my choke points, you know, and doing everything you can pre-planning. And that's where the team guy aspect comes in because we plan so hard. Yeah. We, remember how pissed off we get about oh, our planning yeah. process? Oh, yeah. In the executive protection world, it's everything. everything. Yeah. Everything is planning. And yeah. then as a team guy, being able to modify that plan on the fly. Yeah. That's where we ended up making our money was that, you know, that family was like, we want to go to the Moscow Ballet tomorrow. And you're like, it's been sold out for a year. I okay. don't care. I want to go anyway. And, okay. Okay. Yeah. You go in there and you do whatever you got to do to get them tickets. You, yeah. know, you glad hand, you freaking schmooze, you whatever you got to do. And you learn that a carrot goes very, very far, a lot farther than a stick. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in a situation like that, Moscow or, you know, Africa or wherever, where, you know, I, I get, you know, in, in the United States, it makes sense hearing you describe it, um, you know, higher cops, higher, you know, but there's kind of a hierarchy and a, and a, an assumed level of civility and, and, non-corruptible, you know, force statuses that, that exist that, that would make me feel a lot more comfortable about doing that here. But when you're in, you know, other places in the world where it's the fucking wild west, um, you still employ that same strategy? Yeah, um, you do it again with one eye open, you know, like you're going to multiply your force. 
So you will hire the driver who's armed. And then basically while you're there, you're like, Hey dude, hook me up. Yeah. Oh, well here's a thousand dollars. Oh, okay. Here's your bag. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're always going to have that aspect, you know, especially like Joe Berg, you know, you work with Joe Berg, secret police. They know that hand you the bag when you arrive. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the bag. I'm not supposed to open this bag unless, right. However you have it. And then you, you share. So in the world of ultra high net worth people, you share assets because the assets are very small. Right. So if the Gates family is going somewhere and they've been to Cannes Film Festival, you call them like, hey, we're going we're going to Cannes. Who do you got? Oh, call this dude. Call Mauricio. OK, cool. They call you. Hey, man, you guys been to Kenya. You've been in Nairobi. Who do we call? Oh, hey, call, call freaking call, call Lottie, you know. So you share those assets because the pool is so small. Yeah. And most of those guys in foreign countries usually are their intel guys who've got in the civilian world. So our intel people know who they are. I got you. Right. And then you utilize our own our own collective information agreements with people who you still know who work in government and go, Hey man, I'm getting good to go here. What do you got? Yeah. Who do I stay away from? It's never, sure. never, who can I trust It's Who do I stay away from? You know? Yeah. That makes sense. Are there, are there ever times where, you know, a family says, Hey, we want to go do this uh, on this day or whatever. Are there times where you, where you guys say, Hey, this is fucking too dangerous. We can't pull. I mean, are there times where you're like, this isn't a good idea and, and we can't fucking do this. Like I can't guarantee you, yeah, your I, safety and that—that that was the one issue we ran into with um, the current um, era, the current family lead of of that family is this is very dangerous. You know, we shouldn't. Well, aren't you seals? Like, yeah, but I'm not a magician, and you're a white person in in a place where we're the only white people, and they just had a shooting with thirty people yesterday. Yeah, and so you get in those places, and you you basically come down to okay, I recommend this, and then. In one of those incidents, you have something happen. They're screaming for their, ah, get us out of here. You get them out of there. And they're like, oh my God, we should have listened to you. You're like, you should have listened to me. Yeah. And from that point, that's ultimate trust. Yeah. All right. You never have a second incident. But up to that point, we had multiple of like, aren't you a seal? Yeah. Like, okay, <laughs> Devil Wars Prada. Yeah, I am. But, you know. Fuck, man, that's wild. Wild shit. Um, Budget wise, is it like blank check? Like, hey, we want to go here, whether it's here in the United States, somewhere else, what have you. Uh, is it an issue where it's like, hey, this our budget is X and it's going to cost this and we don't have it? Or is it just like, dude, I don't care what it costs, fucking do it? Um, with Paul, there was no budget. Paul didn't want to have a timeline. He did not want to have a schedule. So if Paul wanted to go anywhere, you go. And you, didn't, you, you don't tell Paul what the cost is unless the cost is an excessive cost. And then it's, you tell him, hey, if we want this, this is what it costs. And then it's on him. 90% of the time, you don't need to do that. Um, because the cost is for us, it's like, oh my God, it's $10,000 for Moscow Ballet tickets. He didn't care. He yeah. just wants to go to Moscow Ballet. Yeah. And later on, you come back, they're like, why did you spend $10,000? Like, Paul told me to. Yeah. Oh, in a conversation. Other times, it's like, hey, you want to jump the line 20 spaces of the Panama Canal. Uh, it's a million dollars. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe we can wait and sit there. What do you want me to do? Yeah. So either he's going to jump the line or you're not going to jump the line. Yeah. So I always tell my clients, plan on 1% per gross profit. So what your net worth is, 1% of your gross profit per year should be designated security. Yeah. And that should be all encompassing. Cybersecurity, unfortunately, is getting to a point where you almost have to have a completely separate budget because China is such a threat. Yeah. All right. Cybersecurity is almost equaling with the budget of executive protection in all static securities now. Yeah. Because it changes so much. And the, and the guys you have to hire to do cybersecurity are cost so much money. Yeah. Right. Even though they sit behind a keyboard, those keyboard guys are really smart. Yeah. I mean, you know, at this point, everything runs through that. Yeah. So it's, they kind of have you by the balls that way. Yeah, so on know? the physical electronic side, you know, electronic surveillance side, we just tell them 1% per gross profit. Yeah. Wow. Um, is there a kind of neatest experience that you got to be a part of because of, of doing that that stands out? Yeah, Africa. It's, it's something that I tell people all the time. They're like, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. I'm like, you should go to Africa. But go to Africa with time. I was able to be in Africa almost three months on multiple occasions. You know, a month here, two months there, three months there. One of the most amazing experiences. I can't even like, it's so hard to describe to see animals in their environment. The, the people, the, the culture of Botswana, the people of Botswana are so kind. They're so just amazing. The food ridiculous the service the level of service you know there's shitheads everywhere but um just 
going to, and I, I have to make sure I don't say it in a corny way, but really Mother Earth, like being to see the great migration in person, you're like, holy fuck, there's 20 million wildebeest out here. I like guess far, like you're on a helicopter and you're just flying all day over wildebeest. Wow. And you're like, or to see a kill happen in front of you, nature in front of you, you're like, yeah. Oh my God, that lion just ate that fucking wildebeest, you know, yeah. that crocodile shit. just chomped down yeah. that antelope, you know, it's, yeah, that shit was that, the coolest shit I ever got to do. Wow. I mean, yeah, I mean, shit that you have to go to the zoo here to, to just see yeah. a, an example of that species. You see them, you know, in droves in their natural yeah, you habitat. Your campsite and giraffe and zebra and, you know, nighttime the lions are walking around your tent and you're like, Man. fuck, you know. Yeah, like, that's wild it shit. Was, that was the... By far, nothing nothing compares to that. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Um, I mean, it's some fascinating shit. You know, I, I can't even imagine like the, all the different experiences that you, that you must have, have had, um, in, in a kind of a similar fashion, you know, I sell, uh, personal protection dogs to a lot of high net worth clients, you know, in kind of similar positions. And I, I often find it, it's kind of a dicey, uh, road to walk with, with a lot of those folks is that, you know, they, they have, the, the type of means to where, you know, that they can pay to not be inconvenienced with anything. And both with what I do and with what you do, you're kind of mitigating inconveniences. I mean, that, that's kind of part of the job or, or what, what you're trying to do for them um, invites some inconveniences that, that maybe they weren't expecting or that, that they, you know, are used to being able to say, fuck that. I don't, you know, I don't want to deal with that or, or what have you. And, and especially in my case, not to get on my soapbox, but you know, a dog, like I can't explain to the dog, Hey, this is your new owner. Uh, do you have any idea who this is? Like the dog doesn't give a fuck, you know, he doesn't understand money or, you know, social media following or, or fame, like none of that shit, shit resonates or, uh, means anything to a dog. And, and it's hard for a lot of times for, uh, you know, some folks to, to kind of reconcile that is that it's like, well, I don't, I don't need another part-time job or another kid, you know, type of responsibility. And that's, that's what having a dog, especially one of these dogs is, you know, it, it, it is uh, a, a lot of extra work and, and you have to put the time in with the dog for them to listen to you. And that's the big thing is that like, it's not a Velcro robot that's going to take commands and direction from somebody who doesn't spend any time with it, yeah. you know? And it's like, I, if I could teach them or train them or communicate that, to them, I would, but I can't. Like, you have to put the time in with them or they're going to look at you like, who the fuck are you? I, I'm not listening to you, you know? So that that's tricky for me. Have you found kind of similar um, issues that come up where there's kind of not pissing contests, but just inconveniences that kind of cause problems and having to deal with people not wanting to, to put up with some of your shit? Yeah, you know, it's you, you go through these iterations of conversations, right? And the dogs are always a big part of my conversation is, I have people call and they inquire like, hey, you know, we, we need security, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, okay, you know, why? And they'll go through, there's an incident, there's something, right? I'm like, okay, first question is, have you had a threat assessment done? No. Okay, well, we highly recommend you do a third-party threat assessment. Okay, what's it cost? Thirty to $50,000. Oh! Like, okay, well, if that shocks you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait to get a load, what's next, right? Yeah. So then you go, okay, what kind of security <clears throat> are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for, you know, I want a guy to follow me around, et cetera. I'm like, okay, well, how long do you want him to follow around? Well, you know, like every day they go to work and when I travel, et cetera, I'm like, that's not one guy. Yeah. That's four guys. Like, because you got to think about overtime. You got to think about burnout. You got to think about travel. You got to think about family life, et cetera. So then you got to get into that, right? And then they start understanding the cost. Well, I want, I want security here while I sleep. I'm like, okay, that's three shifts. But why? Why can't I just have one guy? I'm like, well, this is called the robots. Law, employment law. You don't have your employees working 24 hours a day, right? Yeah. So then you talk about electronic security and the cost of that. Like, well, why can't I just have ADT come do security? My security system. Like, you, you can. can. Yeah, it's complete total dog shit. But yeah, yeah, that's fine. You know, that's that's why they sell it for nineteen ninety nine with a yearly subscription. Yeah, like you want a real security system. This is what it costs, and these are the people we use. And then you get into the dog. You're like, okay, well, yeah, you can mitigate all of that. You can mitigate twenty four hour security, executive protection. Get a dog. 
like, oh, well, I'm like, okay, well, I can't do all of it. Yeah. I can't give you some without the other. I'm like, I'm trying to tell you that this, and then they'll bring up the stories of the dog, whatever. Like, okay, well, there's a story of a seal doing a bad thing one time. Does that mean all seals are bad? And, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of the dogs, right? The dogs are just, I, I'm, I wish I could do what you do. You know, remember when we first started talking, I'm like, yeah. let me come hang, to, hang out with two weeks yeah. to learn. I mean, I just, I think dogs are fascinating. Yeah. I think, I think the things that dogs can do are just, just mind blowing to me. And the person yeah. who can train them. So I'm a big advocate of it. And then, you know, those are the conversations I've had with these clients sometimes of what you need to tell me what you want, because there's a cost to all of it. Yeah. And a lot of people always start off, I just want to do. And like, that doesn't work that way. And yeah. then you start getting into costs and like, okay, well, here's a way to mitigate your cost is to have a dog. And this dog will become part of your family. And there are levels to dog. There's this dog. All this thing is good at is barking. Yeah. There's this dog. that's an executive protection dog. In mid-flight, on the bite, you can turn that dog off and he will start licking your leg. Yeah. Like, there's a level and there's a cost to every one of them. And, you know, I wish more people would take the time to go do one weekend, one day, one hour to go see dog training. Yeah. Because I think it would get rid of so much, yeah. you know, intimidation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's amazing, you know? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I run into and, and I actually, I just got an email this morning actually from people that have bought dogs from other, other vendors at cheaper costs that have run into problems, you know? And I think that's the biggest, if I had to pinpoint, you know, the biggest driver of, I won't even call it misinformation because there are horror stories out there of, you know, this dog bit my fucking kids or, uh, you know, whatever, like, uh, or it didn't do anything when it was supposed to. I mean, you know, they're, they're both equally unacceptable in my opinion. If, if you've purchased a dog that's supposed to protect you and it doesn't, or it's supposed to protect you and it fucking attacks you. I mean, provided you didn't do something really fucking stupid that is way beyond what we even talked about, you know, doing versus not doing. Cause I mean, the reality of it is, is that, if they're physically and mentally capable of defeating a grown man that's physically capable, not scared and intent on hurting him, that takes a pretty special animal to do yeah. that, you know, and that, that dog is only going to put up with a certain level of, of being mistreated or, or unfairly corrected or, or what have you. So, uh, but you know, that, like I've, I've not had any, any issues with that, but there are people that, that have, you know, it's like, I just made eye contact with him and he started growling at, at me and, you know, or my kid walked by and, and he, you know, fucking bitter in the leg or, you know, whatever. And so that, that happens. Uh, I get that fairly often actually, where it's like, Oh, we bought a dog from company X and we're having a lot of trouble with them and they won't, you know, return our calls or they won't do anything about it or what, you know, and it's just like, well, fuck me. You know, I'm like, like you're, you're fucking it up for everybody else, you know? And similarly, like I have, you know, times where people are like, well, how much, you know, does it cost? And I tell them, they're like, well, my budget is this. I'm like, there's a number of companies that provide what, uh, what you're asking for in, in the, budget range that you're talking about, I will just say you, you, you usually get what you pay for, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you run into that. Well, this company's, you know, we'll do it for this. Like, well, go use that company. That's exactly then. what I say. Yeah. You know, I didn't call you. There's yeah. no marketing out there. There's yeah. no media. Yeah. That's the thing too, is like, I like to tell people all the time is, you know, when it comes to people like, what's the difference between this company and this company? I'm like, just come to the range one day. Yeah. Come to the range. You'll understand why I hire very highly qualified guys. Yeah. You'll see it on the range. And, you know, everybody's like, well, this guy shoots up. I'm like, that, that's not the range. That's shooting. I'm going to show you him moving on the range when I call cone drills. And I'm going to show you that he does not have the ability to think outside of what he's been trained in a hundred, in a 90 degree fashion. Mm -hmm. And so if you think he's going to do something different in a real gunfight or in real actions on, you know, et cetera. And it's the same with a dog. Like, oh, well, this company charges this. I'm like, it's not what they charge. It's how they chose. They had to pay a certain cost for a certain dog. Yeah. And that dog out of the hundred from the litters, it chose one to be an EP dog. That was the most expensive one. And at the end of the product, there's a reason it costs a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. It is a house dog. Yeah. It is a friendly dog. It sits there and licks you on the face. Yeah. I mean, the, the other thing with that too, is it's like, especially in that realm and I'll, I'll move on after this. I'm sure not everybody wants to hear you and I bitch about our professions, <laughs> but, um, but you know, a couple of things is that, you know, the, the amount of time that goes into making sure that, that I've thrown everything at that dog, um, you know, inside my house around, you know, my personal relationships around, you know, neighborhoods, other neighborhood kids, other neighborhood pets traveling with it, you know, doing all of the things that I know they're going to be doing with it. And, and I'm doing that, you know, day in, day out with a dog, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping with that dog three feet from me loose 
you know, for weeks or months before, before you ever do, you know, and, and I'm, I'm along every step of that process. And so, you know, it's the original selection, the connections that I have with finding the right dog. And and then me, once I get the dog here of further evaluating it, and there's times where I get that dog in, I say, this isn't the right one. Got to scratch that. And I got to get a different one. I I'm, I'm willing to do that and do that regularly. And even if it's two months into the process, there's times where I will still say, thought this was the right one. It's not. I've seen a couple things that, that give me enough concern to where I, I'm going to say, you know, I, I hate to delay it further and start over, but that's what we need to do. That doesn't happen very often, but it has, uh, and, and I'm willing to do that as well. And uh, and lastly, I would say that, you know, when, when people spend that on a vacation or on a hand in Vegas or on a car, you know, um, it's like this is a, a 10-year security investment for you and your family that you can actually write off also, you know? So, um, you know, I, I get the initial sticker shock, but when you think of it from the, uh, kind of context of, of all of those other, other factors, it's actually a screaming fucking bargain yeah, compared bargain. to hi- hiring four dudes, you know I mean? Which kind of leads me to my next question. I mean, is there, I know every scenario is different, but is there like a, a bare minimum? Like if somebody wants legit, executive uh, security, what is that going to cost them a, a year? I would say at a minimum four to $500,000. Yeah. And that's for just residential guys. If you want mobility guys, you're talking a million. Yeah. That's because the hotels, the flights, rental cars, you know, that all that adds in there. But yeah, you know, if you, if you want a, a complete and total security package, you're looking at a minimum of a million a year. Yeah. But you know, that, that minimum, that million a year is goes so much different ways. Like, you know, you're not going to have to, if you don't want a house manager, you don't need one. Your security guys can do that. If you don't want, uh, you know, there's so many different factors. Like you you don't want a personal assistant. Your security guys can do that. There's so many things where you can start cutting out once you learn that trust. But also they're very loyal. They are dogs, you know, and you hate to say it that way, but I'm a dog, Hmm. right? I'm very loyal to the base, the the, the clients that I am come to, and I want long-term relationships, et cetera. But at the same time, I'm easily correctable. We don't, and I tell them, if don't, don't, don't get mad. Don't let it fester. Tell me if you don't like that guy, yeah. what is, what is he doing? We'll move him. We'll get another person. Cause you know, basically we want, we're here to serve you. Yeah. And I think a lot of people get in those realms where a dog or a person, they're scared to understand that that's your employee. You don't need to be mean to the employee when it's all blown up and you're all flustered. Just say, Hey, this is what I prefer. Yeah. You know, and you know, when, when it comes to those security things, you know, in this world, you get what you pay for. And there's, you know, that's the unfortunate side of this side is I get a lot of resumes and there's just like dogs, right? There's guys who I'm like, I I think you're awesome. I don't think you're going to work out. Not because of experience, because some of these guys, I'm like, holy shit. But I'm like, dude, you've been in Afghanistan for the last five years. I'm not going to put you with a family. Yeah. You're going to be bored out of your fucking mind. You're not going to last six months or you're going to come to the job drunk or something. Yeah. You know, some of those natures. And I, and I, because I've encountered those so many yeah. times. Or you're going to shoot a neighbor for fucking walking yeah, their dog you know, too late it, or whatever. It's like yeah. I need, like <clears throat> I need, I need to see a lot of things. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, when it comes to, if it's a residential security guy, I want to use local off duty cops or retired cops. All right. They're older. They're more mellow. They're more mature. They're not going to be excited. They're already there. You, they're already there. And you know, like say I have a celebrity. We've had people jump the wall. I don't need some young 25-year-old guy putting him down in the yard. Yeah. I need an older 40-year-old guy going, hey, bro. What are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. Go ahead and sit down. Put your hands behind your back. Yeah. And who's been in 100,000 of those situations, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, do you have the right to put the guy down? Absolutely. Yeah. The media and press that comes along with it, holy yeah. crap. You know, yeah. the liability and the litigations. Yeah. So, and then the executive protection side, it's everybody wants to be next to that client. I am a guy who's not good next to the client because I'm not a good conversationalist <laughs> and right? I'm all business all the time. Yeah. And so if you're that guy who I have a friend of mine, his name's Sharky, that dude is the best prince of breast AIC in history. Yeah. He get the clients love him. He's good at his job, but he's conversationalist. Like yeah. he can be one-on-one in a vehicle for hours and hours. I'm not that dude. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a good shift leader. Right. I like coordinating yeah. everything. So you have to find those personalities and then, then you yeah. find that the bad part that I run into is guys who get too close. Yeah. And well, you know, I'm like, as soon as you start a sentence out, well, well, we've already, the, the conversation's over with me. Mm-hmm. I already know what the answer is. And you're trying to tell me because you have this relationship with this client, you've, you've already crossed the line. Yeah. You, you shouldn't be that close to that client. Yeah. And those aren't conversations you should be having. I'm the owner of the business, you know? Yeah. Does that happen often? 
not often, but it, it just recently happened to us is I had one of the guys, you know, he, he stopped listening to the manager and um, essentially went to the principal and kind of vented out what was going on, you know, and it, it, I look into everything. I'm, you know, go deep. And what I found is I go to the team. I don't go to the manager. There's two sides. I don't want to hear either of them. I go to the guys. The guys basically, I'm like, your choice, your teammate, you tell me who's wrong. Yeah. Thumbs up, thumbs down. And then tell me why. And once you find out, I'd be like, you, you're just <coughs> bitching because you're not the manager. Yeah. It's not, it's not you're <coughs> bitching to bitch. You're just bitching to the manager. And what you then did is, and I asked him, like, hey, you know what's going on? Well, sometimes you just got to go to the top of the chain of command. I'm like, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Like, not huh? the principal. You don't work for him. Yeah. I work for him. Yeah. And, um, and those, are, those, 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 those suck. Yeah. Because, it's unto- it's intolerable for me. There's no second chance for me. Yeah. All right. It's you've if you're too stupid to know you're not supposed to do it, you can't work for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Do, do you have instances where your client just is like, I just don't like this fucking guy. Yeah. Get him out of here. Yeah. yeah Even if it's like unfounded, it's just like I just don't like him. Yeah. We've I've had one for real, and I've had three unfounded. And if it's a for real one, then you know we'll we we'll part ways. If it's uh, unfounded, we just move them to a different detail. Yeah. You know, sometimes personalities don't mesh or something goes wrong, you know, like in, in fortune, this world is, I, you know, I won't go into him because the client might listen and know what I'm talking about. Him. Yeah. Some of them are fucking stupid and you're like, really? But you're not going to argue like, Hey, it's your house. Yeah. It's your family. It's your life. You don't like this dude. Cool. Yeah. And, but I'm not, what I'm not going to do is just like, Oh, you're fired. Yeah. Like, Hey man, here's what's happening. You guys aren't meshing. I'm going to move. I'm switching you with this guy. This guy's going over there. I can tell by the, per- what he's saying the personalities are this, yeah, you know, and, and, you know, it, there's many factors to it, you know, long hair, tattoo, you name it. Yeah. Some guys just don't like each other. Some guys, you know, it, sometimes it comes down to that. Some, some women get, see a certain type of man. They don't like him. Yeah. And you know, for me, it's okay. It's chess pieces. You know, yeah. it's, yeah, we do a really good job of vetting. We're, you know, last year we were 98.7% retention. Oh, wow. So. Yeah. That's awesome. So, I mean, in that you hire veterans and it's kind of moving into the next, uh, the other aspect of Spartan Seven and and some of the stuff you're doing with um, the American Addiction Centers, and I'd love to to kind of move into that. Um, tell tell us about uh, kind of what what you do there. Yeah, so um, I was with working with Sergey, and I was always researching a lot of veteran therapy because I was struggling. Yeah, you know, I, I I started really my struggles began when the helicopter got shot down. You know, losing so many friends. You know. In, in such a way. And it, and it sucked because we had just finished this 50 mile hike in Montana. We were floating on air. Our first warm meal, we're sitting there at breakfast and the, the ticker starts going along CNN. And it's the guy's names. And I'm like, oh shit, Rob, Jonas, Blinky. You, know, you just, so many names, right? Lou, I, mean, I, I can just go down the list of people, right? And um, that just sucked because I'm in an environment with a client where I really can't have emotion. So I just kind of, you know, shoved it down. There's another team guy there with me, and we, we were both from Team 7, and a lot of those guys are Team 7 guys. We both were just like, and you want to have emotion, but you can't because you're with this client. So we basically s- sucked it up for a day and a half until we went home. And, uh, you know, then, you know, the next basically week and a half of going to the funerals, and... I just went into this dark black hole <clears throat> and I was able to pull myself out of that hole by doing an Ironman. So during the hours and hours of training for that Ironman, I cried and I got it out. Right. And it was very healing for me, but it didn't, didn't last. Right. And the Ironman ended up beating me up pretty bad. You know, my knee is really, really bad shape. And so as time goes on, I, I, I kind of started struggling more, but I was always trying to research things. You know, I knew I had a severe brain injury and, Long story short, by the time I went to go work for Sergey, I was doing very well, but at the same time knew that I, I felt like I had CTE. Like I've never really thought that it was a PTSD portion. I'm like, I'm starting to feel numbness. I'm having a lot of memory for loss. I'm losing the ability to read and write. You know, I'm, I'm starting to slur. I'm starting to fall down. And I combated that with drinking. I drank. Which helps a lot in that case. Because it, it, it relaxed me. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, yeah. And in that environment, it was very stressful, you yeah. know. And, and so I was on the security side to start with. Then I got moved over to the uh, humanitarian side, which was all about um, the only privately funded humanitarian team in the world. And so just a lot of fun. And, and it was a very great place to be because it was 
I was no longer in the realm of hurting people. I was helping people. We were going all over the world doing humanitarian projects and disaster aid response. And I was able to build the team. So I, one third of the team was special operations guys. One third was Harvard humanitarian. One third was Stanford medicine. And we formed deployment teams all over and we had a great time. Yeah. And so during that process, uh, a group came and basically requested funding. It's like, Hey, we're doing this veteran therapy and um, whatever. So I was called because, you know, some people think I'm smart every now and then. And they said, we want you to research this. And fast forward a few years, I think I was asked to research it because people knew that I was struggling. Right. So our research is called the MAPS program and MAPS psychedelic studies. Okay. I don't know, multiple blah, 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 psychedelic studies. I should know it, but I have a bad memory. I read about the project. I read about the therapy. And at that point, I was around enough team guys and enough, you know, Delta and, and, and special operations guys to understand there was a very severe problem. And the, the severity of the problem was that if guys weren't busy, guys were destroying themselves. And, and I had seen multiple incidents of it. And I had seen how profound the humanitarian team had changed guys' lives because yeah. they were mission oriented again. And I felt that I, traditional therapy wasn't going to do what it needed to do to veterans who had seen a lot of combat. And I felt, you know, after reading what I read, I'm like, I think this could be a, it could be work on a, a certain group of guys. So then they came in and they did an in-person brief. I, I submitted my paper. And actually at that point, I wasn't even able to read or write. So my wife submitted a paper. My wife's in bed, you know, cancer and I think that was a big defining portion for me is I was really struggling with my wife's cancer. Um, you know, you can't shoot it, kill it, stab it. You just, so I drank. And uh, I turned the paper in. Then they came and gave it in-person brief. And while they were briefing, the doctor briefed, and I was basically like, yeah, whatever. Same shit, you know, big words, blah, blah, blah. What do you know? Then another guy spoke, and he was a SEAL who I knew I didn't remember. And I was like, I was really irritated by him because he's smiling. He's all happy. Like, what's this fucking dude's problem, man? Like, why are you all happy? And he's like, oh, Taco, it's so good to see you and hugging. I'm like, why are you hugging me, bro? Like, I didn't even realize I knew him. It was Marcus Capone. No, no, I had sure. not even, like, I didn't even, like, just didn't even recognize him. Yeah. He was so happy. I'm like, what's the matter with you? You know, like, seals aren't happy. We're all, like, mean and nasty, yeah. right? And so then when <clears throat> Amber Capone spoke, it, it rocked me to my soul. And what she had to say about Marcus before he went to that therapy I, I literally, it was everything I could do to sit there. And it was as if I was listening to my wife speak. And she talked about things that were brutal, you know, the this isolation, the anger, you know. And she was very clear. He was never mean to her. but He was just mean. Very, you know, his happiness came when he was alone in his room drinking. And I'm like, that's the only time I'm really happy. You just kind of just go in my, my place and I just drink. I go to sleep, right? And, you know, talking about, you know, intimacy, there was no intimacy. There was just basically uh, sex was very, you know, uh, rough, you know, and, and my wife had complained about that, you know, like, you know, there was no intimacy. There was no, there was no fucking caveman. It was just caveman, right? And, yeah. and, and I had just, you know, it, it was hard to hear that conversation, right? Yeah. And so I, conversation got over and, and I remember going to doc, the doctor and going, can I talk to you? He's like, yeah, I'm like, I, I have a problem, man. Like, I, I think I'm a fucking alcoholic. I'm like, I, I, I just, I, I'm like, something's really, really wrong with me. He goes, I know. What do you mean, you know? He's like, all of you are like this. What do you mean all of us? I was like, there's other dudes. He's like, that's all I treat as seals. He's like, I don't treat anybody else but seals. He's like, all of you drink too much. All of you are so full of darkness and hatred. He's like, all this therapy can do is let you see it. And what you decide to do with it from there is up to you. So I went home and uh, talked to my family and said, you know, tell me about me. And the conversation I had was not good. And they basically reaffirmed what I knew was, was I was cold. I was distant. I was angry. Um, I was a drunk. And so I called and said, I want to go to this therapy. And, you know, you're talking about a guy who never, I think I smoked weed like three or four times in high school. Right. Mm -hmm. So I fly to Mexico, fly down to Mexico and uh, I take the blue pill, right? You take the three blue pills. And I remember taking those pills and one, you're around these hippies and they're like, 
sage around you and shit. I'm like fucking weirdos, you know? But um, it was the very first time I talked. And I talked about a story in the war, the only story, only horror story I have from the war. Um, and it was the first time I'd, I'd, I'd ever spoken about it. And I remember kind of explaining to them what it felt like to kill somebody so brutally and so shockingly, <clears throat> right? And to be covered in their blood and, you know, to hear their family screaming and, you know, and then the next day to find out it was the wrong guy, you know, that, that, that happened that, to you. Yeah. That happened to me. And, um, and you know, the, the mission was right. And we were going after Michael Spiker, trying to find Michael Spiker's body. We were told this guy knew where the body was. And, you know, when we entered in it, it, it turned into a fight and, you know, he died. And, um, the next day they were like, that was the wrong dude. And, you know, so how, I mean, how, how did that happen? Was it bad Intel? Yeah, bad intel. Basically, somebody wanted the same house. So some shake came and said the guy was, this is who the guy was, and knew that Americans were looking for that body. And we went in there, and the guy heard people outside his house, picked up a gun, and defended his family. And he died as a result of it. And I killed him. So, I mean, let me take a pause for a quick second. I mean, to me, like, you know, to to have something like that happen, and, and there's, we don't need a statement from you. We're not going to charge you for murder, but this other guy who is a fucking known shitbag died at Abu Ghraib. And we're gonna we're gonna string you up for that. Is that how the fuck is that even possible? Yeah, and those were like right after each other too. You know, and that was that would suck because it was the you know the next day they were just like, oh yeah, that dude you smoke a lot. You know, one everybody's congratulating you because you know, um, you know he could he could have hurt us. You know, and everybody's congratulating you. And the next day, like, oh yeah, that was wrong, dude. And that was literally how I was told. It was wrong, dude. As, as a guy was walking by me, I'm like, and I remember, I remember that one because, you know, his son was in the same room and I remember picking his son up <clears> by the waist, <throat> carrying him into the room where the women and children were and the way that kid looked at me. That's what, that's, that's what killed my soul. And I remember that. And it was like, I'd never spoken about it. Right. Cause it, I was ashamed. It's it, it shame. I'm ashamed of it, you know? So, wow. <laughs> Didn't think about that. Um, so I talked about that story and I decided to do the therapy. And what I expected to come out during that therapy didn't come out. I expected a lot of war stories to come out, right? A lot of missions, a lot of tragedy, a lot of, you know, gore. That didn't come out at all. It was all childhood. And I was very like, fuck. Because I didn't believe in suppression. I didn't believe in mommy, daddy issues. And I was like, it's fucking weak, right? Team guy it up, man. And as the more of it came out, I'm like, it was just shocking to me. Like, God, am I making, am I making this up? You know, and Baba Wheeler, who's an older SEAL, Vietnam SEAL, was my mentor. And he said, don't hold back. He said, because you can actually fight this medication. It's called Ibogaine, right? The medication's called Ibogaine. He's like, you can actually fight it. He goes, and if you fight it, it's useless. He goes, so don't fucking hold back. He's like, when it, that medication tried to show me my son's suicide, I held back. He goes, so I probably have to do this therapy again. So I just kept my kept saying to myself, just fucking go, just fucking go, right? And it was brutal. Like it was just the scariest shit ever. Like one, it was a free fall gone bad. So I'm literally laying in bed going, fucking counter left, counter left, counter left. If the bed's not moving, you're not moving. The bed's not moving, you're not moving. And I thought they were fucking with me because I kept feeling somebody come punch around me. I'm like, I'm the wrong dude. Like you shouldn't be doing that to me. And then I'd take my mask off and look up. Nobody's there. Like, and it took me a while to go, you're hallucinating. Like the bed is shaking, like the poltergeist is shit, right? I'm like, yeah. the fuck? And uh, it took me a long time to go, you're hallucinating. And so then the, the, the memories just started coming out, right? And, and I had largely forgot about my childhood. I just had largely forgot about it, right? It just was something that I had just, it was moved past it. And at that point, I hadn't spoke to my mom in about probably 15 years, right? And so as these memories were just getting more and more brutal, um, I remember just kept saying like, just show me the one good thing in my life, which is my wife. And I had not been a good husband in the last few years. You know, I, I just wasn't a good husband. I was, I was using her cancer as an excuse to be an excuse. You know, that's really what really all it was. And I was a coward. You know, I, I didn't, I couldn't see, I couldn't see it. I couldn't face it. So I would just fucking go to Coronado and get shit faced at Danny's, you know, and I'd leave Silicon Valley, go to Coronado and then, come home the next weekend, you know, she's in bed, spent a couple of days. And I, I just couldn't deal with it, man. It was just too hard. So I, I, I kept asking, like, show me Leilani, show me Leilani. And this purple rain would fall. 
right? And it would wash that memory away, and then another one would start. And again, right? And, it were, and the memories were like movies. They were like computer files that open up, and then this movie would play, and I'm like, fuck, I remember that, you know? Oh, my God. Like, and at the same time, I could, I could remember hearing the screams, and oh, So, as the, the night went on, I realized that my wife was my purple rain, right? And I was like, fuck, the one good thing I've ever had in my life is this amazing woman who did almost my entire career with me, right? I mean, she went to the funerals with me. She hung the fucking pictures on the wall at Danny's with me. Like, she, she did everything, and I have treated her like shit, you know, I have not been a good husband. I have not been the thing that I promised I would be. You know, and it just, it just was just clear. Like, oh my fucking God, this is so clear. And then these other memories, like these, these, I guess we, I guess the right word is pontifications would come out like, I fucking get it. I get why I was always attracted to older women. I always had this epitome, this thought of what my mom, I wished my mom would be in a business suit and this elegant, educated woman. Oh, okay. Now I know why I was always so close to my seal brothers. My brother and I got taken away from each other because my mom hurt us really bad, right? She, she, she hurt us really, really bad and we almost died and he had a different dad and his dad took him away. I never saw him again for like 14 years. What happened to you? What did she do? She just beat us really, really bad, right? She burned us and... It was just bad, right? She and it was for a long time. So, um, and so I was like, ah, oh, right. And then it was like, I understood why it was always so easy for me to prey on men, right? Like to me, men were just prey, right? Like I loved seals because seals fought back and they could fight. Most dudes can't fight. Like they they say they can, then you end up pounding them a few times. They just fall on the ground. You're like, this ain't fun. You know, so that, that made sense to me, like, why I enjoyed the war. Like, I was, uh, this was easy, right? So all these, like, epitome, epiphanies came out. And the next day was probably even more brutal because, you know, now the medication wore off, and so I'm just kind of wore off. So I'm just laying there staring at this knot of wood for, like, you know, eight, ten hours. In the morning, it was all, like, why did it, why? Like, why did all this happen to this, these little boys? And so Kristen, the counselor, came in. She's like, I want you to go in that house and we grab those little boys and take them out. I'm like, we ain't doing that shit. Dan ain't going down that road. Right. So on my own, I kind of dealt with that. Like, why, why did, why did my mom do that? Why, why was it so easy? Why was it so often? Right. So then I went from there to fuck it is what it is. Like, I fucking is what it is, man. So I spent a few hours there and then I went to, I don't really give a fuck. I just don't give a fuck. Like, fuck you. You know, like, I don't care. And then I transitioned from that, I don't give a fuck to, man, I'm actually kind of glad it happened. You know, like, I'm actually kind of glad all this happened because you can't hurt me. You can't, you can't call me names. You can't starve me. You can't burn me. You can't freeze me. There's nothing you can fucking do. You can't get in me. Like, I'm undefeatable, you know? And then the final part was forgiveness. I remember sitting there and I was, you know, really, really in a, in, a, in, a, in a place. And I just, I was, you know, like, dear Lord, please just show me she loved me. Just show me that my mom actually loved me. And literally, the fucking moon came down and shone over the ocean. It was beautiful. And I was like, thank you. That's all I ever wanted to know. Because my mom never told me she loved me, right? My mom was not a hugger or anything like that. And I remember just sitting there like, and in the corner of the room, this image appeared. And, you know, by the time my mom died, she didn't have any arms and she, only, she had no legs and only one arm and the diabetes eating her away. And I remember seeing this image and I talked to this image for a long time and I made peace with it. Right. And so I remember waking up the next morning, going to the doctor and I'm like, you know, this medication is very dangerous, by the way. So you have a doctor with you and you have a nurse and you're hooked up to an EKG, the whole gig. Right. And I go to the doctor. I'm like, if it happened, don't tell me, but I think my mom died last night. I go, and if it happened, don't tell me until this is over. So he came back a few hours later, and he's like, your mom didn't die, but she's in the hospital. She's in critical care. And I was like, okay, that made sense, right? So I was very at peace. So I went for the first time for a long walk on the beach and just, you know, kind of let it all out. And I just felt free. 
So then later on that day, you do another medication called 5-MeO-DMT. Now, again, remember, I've never done a drug. So now I'm going to smoke something. I'm like, I'm going to put something in my lungs. And my one thing about me is like, I have always considered myself to be a very powerful athlete, right? So I'm not going to pollute my body with shit, you know? So, okay, you're going to smoke this fucking toad poison, essentially. And so I, I smoked the toad poison first time. Nothing really happened. It kind of was like <clears throat> really freaky, like, oh, that was fucking weird, you know? So small dose. The second dose, big dose. And they call it the God molecule. Like, you're going to have this death experience. You're going to have this angelic experience, whatever. So the second one, I did not have that. I had a realization of why my mom became so mean. And I went back to, I was probably five years old. My brother was about seven. And my mom was being brutally uh, beaten and raped by a group of men. And my brother and I had to listen to it. And we tried to intervene. Obviously, we couldn't. We're little. And it, and it wasn't, it wasn't a, a short iteration. It was a long iteration. And I was able to remember that prior to that, my mom was a very kind woman. And after that, she was not. And so I remember waking up from that. And in this room, remember, we're only seals. I could feel them. So I'm up on my knees and I could feel them behind me. And I remember looking at the doctor. I'm like, I need you to tell all those dudes to get the fuck out of this room because I'm about to kill them. Like, I want to fucking kill men right now. He's like, okay. And I'm like, not you. You stay. He's a very healing man, right? Like, you stay. And there's the two counselors are both female. I'm like, I, I just, he's like, you want to do another hit? I'm like, yeah, dude, because this is not good. Like, I, I'm in a murderous rage right now. And so I took the third dose. And in that third dose, I had that death experience. And I got to spend time with my mom. And it was the most beautiful, like, moments I just remember sitting there and we were laughing and just, you know, so emotional. <laughs> um, what, what amount of time passed between? Hits? They're probably 15 minutes each. Okay. Right. And so that last one was just so deep, so like beautiful. And I remember kind of coming out of that, that, that realm and coming to, and just, I remember sitting up and looking at, doc, at the doctor and I'm like, I don't ever want to harm another human being ever again in my life. Like, and I looked out the windows, I'm like, it's just so beautiful. Like, the, I, I, I'd never seen beauty. Like, I literally, in my life, I don't think I'd ever seen beauty. And I remember just looking like, oh, my God, this world is so beautiful. And I went down to the ocean, and for the two days I was there, even though I'm a seal, I wouldn't get in the water. I felt dirty. I got in there, and I played, and I spotty served. I mean, snow castles, snow angels, just, just glorious fucking time, right? And uh, I remember flying you know from there to back to work which is stupid i should have taken a week off but i flew back to work and i remember sitting in the san francisco airport and this will sound really fucking weird especially to the knuckle draggers i found out why i fought the war like it all fucking made sense to me right there i looked over and there's these two gay men and they're not kissing they're just like embracing somewhat but i could tell they loved each other and i was like that makes sense to me like, that fucking makes sense. They deserve the right to live any way they want to fucking live without being judged. And I look over a little bit more, and there's an old lady feeding french fries to her husband. And I'm like, that makes sense to me. That's what I want. I want to grow old with, this, with my beloved wife. And it was very, like, whew, right? And then the, the last one was I look over, and there's this man uh, playing <laughs> cars with his son. And I remember going, fuck, that's my legacy. Not being a SEAL. That's my legacy. My children are my legacy. My children are the greatest gift. And this woman gave me that gift. She gave me the opportunity to be their father, right? And I remember just sitting there going, fucking hell, I fucking get it. Like, I was so like, fuck, right? Like, I get it. I totally fucking understand it now. I, I get it. And every day since that day has been just like an understanding of what my purpose is, right? Like I think everybody searches what your purpose is. And I've always been reluctant to have this in front of me. You know, people are like, oh, we'd love to give you a speech, whatever. And I'm always like, why me? Like, I don't, what the fuck you want to talk to me for? I'm nobody, right? I write a book. And I'm like, I can write a fucking book. I want to write a book about football. I want to write a book about the war, you know, like I don't, I didn't do anything. And, um, uh, I finally got it. And I remember going on Facebook and just telling my story. Like, this is what just happened to me. And if you guys need help, 
call me. I, I want to fucking help you and don't be embarrassed. Like I'm not fucking embarrassed. Yeah, I took a fucking drug and this is what I found and I got 20 years of counseling in a weekend and holy fuck, my life is better and I don't know how long it's going to last. The flip side was as we left the border, remember I went down there a two bottle day tequila guy. No shit, I drank two bottles of tequila and I had a lot of money. I made really good money working for Sergey, so I was buying really good tequila. Guy came at the window, knocked on the window. He's like, senor, senor, tequila, tequila. And I looked at him like, I don't drink. I remember like, did I just fucking say that shit? <laughs> like, what? And I haven't drank a drop of alcohol since then, right? Wow. And all these like things happened, you know, post that, New Year's Eve that same year. You know, I remember sitting there going, this is the first time I've been sober on New Year's Eve since I was 12 years old. Oh, Fuck. Since you were 12? 12 years old, right? Jesus. Like, fucking hell, you know? And uh, so I got to go back to, to work. And immediately upon my return to work, one of the other SEALs that was there was struggling really hard. Like really, really struggling. I remember sitting with him all night, listening to his story, and found out his parents had severely abused him sexually. And, you know, he had been involved, and he, by himself probably killed 200 people. And, you know, was in the same place. He was enjoying it. He loved it. And now he was lost because his career was over. And he had this immense amount of guilt because he's the only survivor from Extortion 17. So he got hurt a few days before that and got hit by a grenade, wasn't able to go, and everybody died. And Lou Langlius replaced him. And just listening to the to him and, you know, being able to, being able to spend time and, and share space with him. And, like, I was like... God damn! For this moment, I I I, I want to be in this moment with you. Like I want to be able to help you. I don't want to fix it. I just want you to know that it's okay. Because you could tell he'd been holding it in. Can you say uh, who it was, or you'd rather? I, I'd prefer not to. Fine. You know, I mean, it's yeah. It, no, no worries. Yeah. Um, and I remember just he and I became very very close. You know, because I think we shared that like holding it in for so fucking long, and the, to let it out, right? Yeah. Because you know, one, we don't talk. We never fucking talk, right? And then little by little, more and more guys started coming around me like, hey, man, I'd love to talk to you. Right? Okay. And next thing you know, they said, hey, we'd love for you to manage the financial portion of this endeavor. And how many more guys can we help if we give this much money? I'm like, you give us that much money, we can do 400 guys. Right? And so next thing you know, the program went from like two or three guys a weekend to when I was a waiting list of guys, all SEALs, and then all my friends. Right? And now I'm flying and doing interventions for guys. And now I'm like seeing guys who we know who are beyond broken, right? And I see them in public, they're fine, but then you go to their house and they're just broken. And I'm like, I can help you. And so little by little, I started helping guys, right? And it was awesome. And next thing you know, I get a phone call, like, hey, I, I need security. And I'm like, well, fuck, okay. And he's like, I, I want to help veterans. And I'm like, and I, I remember going, oh, fuck. I have guys who are like totally clean and sober who are fucking like, great, awesome human beings, I bet they'd be great security guys. I remember calling them. They're like, fuck yeah, we want to do it. You know, like, I don't want to do it all. I don't want to do it full time. I'm like, what do you think about a rotation guy? He's like, yeah, fine. That's cool. So I put eight guys together to do a, a two guy, two man per day rotation. And that was the beginning of the security company. Yeah. And so as, as we, <clears throat> as we come to fruition, more and more is happening. I called Michael Cartwright, who was the founder of American Addiction Centers. And I had met Michael during a SEAL training event, you know, years before and was, you know, yelling and screaming, spraying in the face with the hose, right? So I remember calling him, I'm like, hey, dude, uh, I know you own this, like, addiction company. Like, I, I got, I only have five beds. I, I, don't, I can't treat enough guys. I got too many fucking guys. He's like, well, we can't even fuck with that shit you're talking about in Mexico. He's like, we're a publicly traded company, et cetera, et cetera. He goes, however, we can find a way to help. So I flew down with him, came to his company. Uh, you know, end up meeting a lot of the counselors and talking about my experience. And next thing you know, he was like, Hey, I'd love for you to come, you know, consult for us. And, you know, he's like, I, I, we don't have a veteran program. We've tried to break into the VA and we can't. And I'm like, well, I know a lot of people, the VA, I know a lot of people in the white house, et cetera. You know, let me help you. So we, you know, signed a consulting agreement with him. And, uh, on the same day I got promoted, uh, over at global sport and development, I was with Michael and he, I got off the phone and I, I guess I had a look of bewilderment on me because it was a massive promotion. And remember I, two, a year and a half before that, I was being told we'd fire you if, you, if, your, wife, if your wife didn't have cancer, we'd fire you. Wow. That's literally where I was. Went from that to, hey, we want to promote you to the chief of staff. And I'm like, fuck, you know? And um, 
I remember sitting there and he's like, fuck that. Uh huh. He's like, come be my chief of staff. And he's like, I'll fucking pay you whatever you want, whatever. I'm like, well, I work at fucking this month. I was like, you can't pay me. You, like, you never match that paycheck. And I just sat there. I'm like, that's not my motivation right now. And I remember calling Leilani and I'm like, hey, you know, here's the two things going on. One has this paycheck with it. The other one doesn't. I go, but the other one's going to give me the freedom to do what I want to do. And that was my only stipulation, Michael. I'm like, here's the minimum, I, the minimum I'll accept. Because, you know, this is what I make now. I have to make that. I go, I want to be an owner of a company. I don't want to be an employee. I'm like, so I want stock options. And um, I only want to answer to you. And I want to be able to take this veteran program and build it in the level that I think it needs to be built. Because it isn't just SEALs who are suffering. SEALs get all the notoriety because there's so much popularity. But you got these 18-year-old Marine kids. Like when this war ends in, in, you know, in 20 years, you're going to have kids who've been at war for 20 fucking years. And we are not prepared for that. Like this 22 veteran day suicide thing, it's not real. It's more like 40 because guys are sitting on their couch and they don't wake up. Like we hear about the ones who actually commit suicide. We're not hearing about the ones who just drink themselves to death. Right? Like this country is not prepared for this. Your counselors have no idea how to deal with this. You have to prepare for it. And he said, okay. And so I accepted the job and that's been my job since then is doing nothing but veteran outreach and veteran work and, my entire goal was I want veterans to come to American Addiction Centers at zero cost. My entire, to go to, be able to go to Mexico at zero cost, right? And then getting, working with foundations to understand, you know, there's just a lot of stigmatism to, you know, uh, therapy, right? Uh, basically, you know, using a fucking hallucinogen for therapy. There's a lot of stigmatism too. And it's like, I'm not saying this therapy is for everybody. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you not to. I'm telling you, this is for the 1% of people who are immune to traditional therapy, that without doing something, they're just going to kill themselves because they're too hard, they're too stubborn to ever admit there's a problem. And they don't want to sit in a room with you for six months until they feel comfortable enough to start talking. That's the reality. For six months, a guy's going to sit in a room, and you and I, we're going to sit across from each other, and what does that do? That's confrontational. When do SEALs get called to the office? When do men get called to the office when they're in trouble? So now you got to go to the office. They're going to talk to somebody who's never been to war. That's the first thing they're going to say, you don't know what the fuck I'm going through. Okay, yeah, they're a trained licensed clinician. They're not supposed to know what you're going through. They're supposed to help you get through it. But that wall is never, they're never going to cross the line to even go down that road. And then trying to get an appointment. It's fucking impossible to the VA. I waited a month and a half to talk to a psychiatrist, right? And so that was my goal was to, uh, we need to figure this out. And then since I've been there, my goal is how do we, how do we finalize it? We've got them clean. We've got, them to, we've got them understanding this. How do we fix them now? It isn't just about getting them sober. Now, how do we fix them? Let's look at their hormones. Let's look at their injuries, stem cell therapy. Let's look at their brains, hyperbaric chamber therapy. You know, and unfortunately, there's everything you try, there's always some kind of counter. Like somebody came out with a study, hyperbaric chamber shows no efficacy. Yeah, because you did it at one atmosphere. It's supposed to be at two atmospheres. And here is the results at two atmospheres. You know, and the final part for me was job placement of how do I get mission oriented people back to work. Oh, and that was the way I marketed Spartan seven and was, I want to put veterans back to work. All right, I want to put first responders back to work back in mission oriented ways, but really be around each other. Cause I think that's the number one factor is that we leave the military and we go to our communities and we're back in isolation, even though we're not really isolated we're with our families we don't have somebody who knows how to say fuck and motherfucker and blah, 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 talk about loading mags, right? So to get them back together on security projects. And, you know, we have the array of security projects. We have the high level ones and we have the biggest one, the biggest part of our company is construction site security. And we have high level guys doing construction site security. And I ask them why, like you have a, you have a master's degree from, from, from USC. You went through the entire Navy SEAL master's degree program. You sit and watch cameras for me. Like, yeah, Dan, I do. And it's quiet and I love it. Yeah. And I'm like, Fucking and yeah. I get to be around the guys. Yeah. You know, their, their turnover is 20 minutes long, but they're like, for 20 minutes, I get to be around another guy, another, another, another dude who gets me, you know? Yeah. And no, that's, that's important. I mean, you, you hear it all the time with the talk about tribe and, and all of that. And, you know, it's, it's very, uh, very real. I think, you know, ha- having that, that type of bond with, uh, you know, with like-minded, whatever you are, you know, man, woman, fucking you name it. Uh, you, you need to have people that 
that you can spend time with that, uh, you know, that are like-minded that way. It's, it's super important. Um, do you, do you know if there's any movement to try to legalize that stuff here and, and if there's been any progress or is it just like a total dead end? No, luckily you have the one state that gives a fuck. Really? Right. So Oregon kind of took the lead by <laughs> making psilocybin legal, Colorado as well, but it's pockets. Oakland was the very first place to make it legal for therapy, but Texas has essentially said we're going. I think Texas understands they have a massive veteran population, a massive veteran problem right? You have a serious alcohol problem with veterans in Texas and the state of Texas and the politicians that I've met give a fuck in that aspect. And so the university of Texas at Austin has a, they created an entire department just to study psychedelic, uh, psychedelic therapy, wow. it's an entire department at university of Texas studying it. Right. And now there's multiple treatment facilities in Austin that are opening. Not all the medications are legal, right? So there's, everything has a step process. Ibogaine, I think is still years away from being legal because unfortunately it can, it can kill you, right? And cause you brachycardia if administered incorrectly. And it's a very select group of people who know how to administer it. However, if you look at Ibogaine studies in the 1970s, and unfortunately they're not full FDA studies. There are very small studies. It had an 80%, 87% efficacy rate in heroin addicts. Oh, wow. So after one therapy, 87% of heroin addicts stopped using heroin, right? <clears throat> and so I think that somebody is going to get that approval to run a full study. So the study that we're part of is fully legal to do, yeah. but it can't be administered in America. So now the cost associated with getting somebody south of the border or down the Costa Rica or wherever where you can administer the drug, right? That's the, that's, that's, that, that absorbs a lot of funding. Do you, if you could get somewhere in America where you could get that, you decrease 70% of the funding that goes into it right there. Yeah. Do you have the 30-second elevator pitch on how, how it works, what it does? Yeah. So Ibogaine basically goes deep into the suppressed mindset. So all psychedelics do. Psychedelics unlock your brain. So as a person, we always have guards up. We always have, our, we always have the football helmet on. With this, you know, MDNA can basically pull the helmet off a little bit. Ketamine can pull it off a little bit. All these things can pull it off. Ibogaine can take the helmet off. Take the helmet off. Now, Ibogaine can take your backpack off, which is full of bricks, trauma, full of PTSD, because PTSD is not one incident. It's hundreds, hundreds, and dump it out, completely dump it out. For me, I was able to dump out my entire backpack, and when I put it back on, there were three bricks in it. And it was so amazing to be understand those three bricks. Brick number one was my dog right? I always dislike dogs, right? It's just weird because I love dogs now, but there's a reason. And I never knew what the reason was. Well, when I was seven years old, my house burnt down and my dog got caught inside the house. I didn't know that I literally had photo albums full of pictures of me and this dog. And I had to listen to the dog burn to death, Jesus, fuck. right? Running back and forth. And that's during that, during the treatment, it came out, right? And you and didn't I, remember that? I, I didn't remember it. I completely forgot about it. And I guess for years I would see the pictures and I would cry until my mom just basically put the photo albums away and you can't look at these anymore because I would just go kind of crazy, right? So I would come home and my dog, which is so excited to see me because the dog loves me so much, would piss. And it would piss me off like fucking goddamn dog, right? So what I did is I put a fence up between the kitchen and the, and the, and the entryway. And I come in, she's on one side, I'm on the other side. And when she comes down, I open the gate. And we're like the best of fucking friends now. She's an amazing dog. Like, I love her so much. Like, she's my little poopoos, right? Like, I, <laughs> I love her. She's a fucking amazing dog. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe it. How could I ever dislike this dog? So that was brick number one. Brick number two was shoes. So, you know, I have three kids and I have fucking more goddamn nephews and you can fucking <laughs> shake your stick at. Um, and then I had football teams. I've always coached football teams. So you go into my house any given time, there is a hundred pairs of shoes in the entryway. And I would get fucking irate. And the bad part is, is I got to a point where I was starting to throw shoes and throw them out of the house and throw them in the garbage, just being an asshole, just being a fucking asshole. And so I came back from therapy, the shoes are all there, and I just put them against the wall. Just like straight them out. And so I used to get, literally go fucking high order. And that was a brick. And I'm like, I'm not gonna let that bother me. They're kids, man. Yeah, I can tell them to straighten their shoes out and I can just get the fuck out. Like, just be an asshole. Just straight. It takes fucking 30 seconds. Yeah. So now I put the shoes away. And I think that that brick comes because I was really poor. And so I'm the kid who had to go to the bin, try to find two matching shoes, hopefully the same size, right? And I think I became a really good fighter because one year I had to wear cleats to school. And the kids made fun of me. And I'm like, oh, fuck it, motherfuckers. I mean, yeah, I have to wear cleats. That's what my mom can afford. But you're going to make fun of me. 
I'm going to use these cleats on you, you know? And so I guess that was a brick. And I solved the brick by just building cubbies. And now I straighten the shoes out. And I just, it was a brick gone. I'm like, that was so stupid to be angry about. The third brick took me a lot longer. You know, I have been in business for a while. And, you know, a lot of guys, you know, they, they go into business. They go to school. They get a degree. And then they get the teams. They go right into business. And I was with a couple guys who right away got, we got a great business deal, massive business deal. As we got into it, though, I started finding some very suspicious things with the guy we're doing business with. And I let the other two guys know. I'm like, hey, man, this doesn't, this doesn't seem right. Like, I've heard this story before. Like, no, he's a billionaire. He's a billionaire. I'm like, a lot of guys are billionaires, and then they invest, and they're not billionaires anymore. Like, I was with a guy who had $27 billion and then got all the way down to $5 billion. They lose massive amount of monies in startups, et cetera. I'm like, I have no doubt he used to be. I'm telling you now he's not because he's paying me on different credit cards and sometimes the credit cards aren't going through. He's telling me there's wire transfers and the wire transfers are not coming. I'm like, wire transfers take 15 seconds, bro. I do them all the time. So we end up doing a big event, glorious event, right? And hand all the guys checks, everybody gets paid and I have to make the phone call later on going, don't cash those checks because there's no money. The guy didn't pay his bill. And so I cashed out my retirement to make sure everybody got paid. And I'm explaining this to these guys. And by then they had, I think they had sold a portion of their company to him. And uh, we never had a falling out. I just we basically got to a point I'm like, you know, you guys are being, having the wool pulled over your eyes. And the bad part is it was a family. The guy was a family friend of one of the guy's dads. He's fucking having the wool pulled over your eyes. And so that guy, the, 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 the client went to those two other seals and said, if you continue working with Dan, we'll, I'm not going to work with you again. And he had a, he has a big network. And so, you know, we stopped working together. And the bad thing was they're very, very close friends. Well, long story short, fast forward, that guy ended up becoming a turd. They realized it. And um, a lot of bad shit came from it. And they both called me one day and they're like, we're fucking sorry. And it was the final brick. And, you know, today, you'll never hear me bring it up to them because, hey, man, it's over. It would, to me, it's the greatest thing that ever happened because they learned which I had to learn the hard way. We're, the way SEALs learn is through pain. Pain is the greatest teacher. And our relationship today, I think, is stronger than ever. And, you know, it's one of those things where, will we do business again in the future? I don't know. You know I don't know. There'll be stipulations along with because I'm not a stupid businessman anymore, but I'm not going to hold an animosity. I don't hold any animosities to anybody except probably two people. And those two people know why. Outside of that, if somebody pisses me off now, I'm like, whatever. Yeah, you cut me off in traffic. Fuck, you should have left earlier. I just don't get. I I, just, I I don't want to be angry anymore. I don't want to be. I don't want to have the fucking, you know, like my problems are not other people's problems. Yeah, you know, I I want to. I really am happy. For the, I I don't know if I ever knew what happiness was. I don't know if I ever knew what even love was. Like I'm madly in love with my wife, right? I'm I'm madly in love with my children. Like I. I I, I get emotional just watching my children and they're grown. Like yeah. my fucking son's 26. My daughter's 21. My, my son's my other son's 20. And I mean, the other day my son fixed somebody's car, right? Like we're towing, we have a classic car we're, we're redoing together. And the guy who's towing it broke down and my son got in there and fixed it. And he went to NASCAR. He's a NASCAR mechanic. Oh, sure. I'm sitting there watching him. I'm like, I mean, literally, like, someone started crying. I'm like, it's my little baby boy. He's fixing the car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and my daughter That's was awesome. on a TV show and, yeah. you know, and That's I'm just cool. sitting there like, Holy fuck, man. My, my children, they inspire me. Yeah. You know? No, that's what it's all about. I, I had a really, uh, I mean, it's, it's really neat to hear you. I mean, you can see it, the emotion in your face when you talk about them, you know, how, how you light up and, you know, my kids are, are a fair bit younger than yours, but they're not babies, you know? And, uh, I had an interesting conversation with my dad. This was years ago. I mean, it was not, not long after I became a parent, you know? And so he's, uh, a fairly freshly minted grandparent and, Similarly, like, you know, he, again, he, he and my mom were always uh, really even keeled and, and great parents, um, you know, couldn't have asked for a better, <clears throat> better experience upbringing wise from them. But, you know, seeing the, the, the kind of transition from parent to grandparent was, was really neat in them. And, and even with him saying, you know, kind of, it, it makes sense now, or like, I, I, I get the uh, the aura associated with being a grandparent, it never made sense, but it does now. And, and the best way he could describe it was, 
was essentially like life goes on, like a, like a circle of life kind of thing. Is that, is that like, I, I don't feel or, or, you know, I don't fear death or, you know, um, think about mortality the, the way that I used to, because I see my kids having kids and it's hard to explain. And it probably doesn't make any fucking sense, but, but you'll get it one day, you know, type of thing. And it was just, it was really neat to see, see that transition uh, and shift in, in him as, as uh, he became a grandfather, you know, uh, bo- both of them, you know, you just see a, a difference with the way that your, uh, your parents uh, treat, treat your kids. If, uh, uh, if you're lucky enough to experience that, I guess, but, uh, but I, I see a, a lot of a kind of a similar energy in you, you know, hearing you talk about your kids as they, they grow up and, and whatever. It's just neat, uh, neat to see. I'm, I'm lucky, right? I, I, I tell my wife all the time, one, I'm, I'm finally a mature man. I think I became a mature man about four years ago, right? Which you always say, I'm a fucking mature man. I really wasn't. I, yeah. I was not a mature man. I think four or five years ago, I became a mature man. And, and then I'm lucky to have had such three massively profound experiences. One, going down to Mexico and doing the therapy and then two, nearly losing my life twice, health concerns, right? Because as a SEAL, you don't think about that shit. Yeah. Like, I, I, think I, ha- I think I had a want to die in the war. You know, I, think I, I think in the back of my subconscious that I wouldn't have minded that. And I think about that all the time, like, holy fuck, man, I would have I, I ruined my family, you know? And so, you know, when, when I went to Mexico, big profound, like, whoa, okay. And then when I had my stroke, that was... That was very like, I don't want to die. Like, wow, like being there and being a vegetable and that's so scary, right? Because you can hear everything going on around you and you can't talk and you can't move. And I'm sitting here going, how the fuck did this just happen to me? How, how did that happen? Um, I think it was self-induced, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. So uh, I was, tra- so American Addiction Center was going through a bankruptcy at that time. And, and I was the lead of trying to help get the company ready to be restructured. So I'm traveling like crazy and it was stressful. You know, um, Michael Cartway was a very dear friend of mine and, you know, he basically was, was in not so many words kind of forced out of his own company and, you know, kind of seeing what happened to him. It, it was, it was painful, right? Cause I, I admire him. And, you know, the new CEO came on board, Andrew McWilliams and a tremendous human being and the amount of work that everybody put in to save that company, you know, and, it was very stressful. So I was, I was traveling. So nobody else in the executive team was traveling. I was the one traveling. I mean, I'm traveling like crazy. And, you know, I've been on testosterone therapy for a long time. It's important. I want people to understand this is that some people who take testosterone, get they, their blood gets thick. And if you travel, it, you're, you have prone to blood clots. And so I had been traveling. I was on testosterone therapy and I had not donated blood in like a year and a half. And for a guy like me who produces a tremendous amount of blood, you need to donate your blood often. And about three weeks before that, I had donated blood. And they were like, your blood's so thick, we almost can't take it. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I'm sitting there at my kitchen table. I just literally got off the plane. And I'm on a very, very you know stressful phone call. And I started doing invoices. And I started making mistakes. And I remember you know, one of my clients' representatives was like, Dan, like, you, you made a mistake here. And I'm like, fuck, what? I did it again. And same, she's and you know, and she knows me. I'm, I'm. When it comes to math, I'm, I'm a nerd, right? I like math. And um, she's emailing me back and forth. She's like, finally, she's on the phone. She's like, "You okay?" I'm like, you know, Melina, I'm just gonna stop. Like, I, I, I don't know what's the matter with me. I, I, I fucking can't. I don't even, like the number I hit is not the number that's appearing. Like, I don't know what's. I, I, I think she needs. To, I'm tired. You know, I'm like really tired. And so I closed the computer and I'm like, whatever. And we had family people in town. It was our first Thanksgiving in our new house. And so we had family friends in. And luckily, another SEAL was there, a SEAL medic. And so my wife cooks. This is Wednesday night, cooks dinner. And I remember getting the dinner. I'm like, Lele, this fucking meat's not cooked. She's like, yeah, it is. I'm like, Lele, it's pink. She's like, Danny, that meat's cooked. And she's getting pissy, right? So I'm like, <laughs> oh, fuck it, man. I'll just eat the shit, you know? Yeah. I'll eat this raw meat. And I just remember sitting there like, huh and the bowl starts spinning in front of me i'm like okay i don't drink but my kids do party didn't these little fuckers give me an edible (laughs) right (laughs) so i'm sitting there watching the bowl and i'm like what the fuck is going on and i remember hearing this voice like dan are you okay and nobody calls me dan and i remember turning my head i'm like i just need to sit down they're like you are sitting down i'm like i need to sit on the ground i remember they, they 
I thought I thought I walked to the couch. They carried me to the couch, and they're like, "You need to go to the hospital." I'm like, "I'm cool, I'm cool." They're like, Are "You having a heart attack?" I'm like, "No, I'm not having a heart attack. I, I just I, I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm I'm just really confused right now." I'm like, and Booby, who is a seal, I want to say his real name, had just finished medic school. He's one of the kids I trained. He's like, "I think you're getting ready to have a seizure." He's like, "I think you might be getting ready to have a stroke." I'm like, "No, fuck no." I'm like you're stone, bro. He's like, no, let's, we need to get you to the garage right now. I'm like, listen, I'll just drive myself to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. So I started walking to the garage and my brain told me I walked to the garage. The reality is my oldest son carried me. You know, luckily he's a hoss. And he carried me to the garage. The next thing I knew, my feet were up on my med bag and I'm mean, telling them how to, how to keep me alive. Like, you need to do this. You need to put the pants on me. You need to get as much blood to my brain as you can. Something's going on in my brain. And I would have these moments of lucidity, like where I could, blah, 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 and then I could be able to talk. And I, because, you know, I, I, you know I, I know a lot about medicine. Like, this is what you need to do. Boom, 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 boom. Call 911. Tell them they have to take me to Vanderbilt, right? So ambulance comes and, you know, they get in the ambulance and obviously they didn't tell them I need to go to Vanderbilt. So they're like, oh, we're going to take you over here to Murfreesboro Hospital. I'm like, Mm, I could do this <laughs> Vanderbilt. I knew I'm like, I have to go to a big hospital. Yeah. I'm in real. I'm in serious trouble. So I got there and maybe the cat scan, like you have a massive blood clot in your brain right now. Here's what's going on. We're going to give you the TAP or TPA. I don't know what's it. And, um, the next 12 hours were just it's like a blood thinner or what is it's it? blood, massive blood thinner. Yeah. And you can't even like move. Cause get, you know, if you move, you can tear your muscles, whatever. Wow. And, um, yeah, for the next 12 hours, man, I was Stephen Hawking. Wow. And I would have these moments of, clarity where i could like and i could like literally i'm like uh uh uh, uh one and then i'm like it, i feel like i'm like a little on it's coming write this down boom, boom, boom here's the bank accounts here's this call this person call that person tell andrew and karen what's going on this is because we have a you know the accounting for the company yeah tell them what's going on here's their phone numbers here's uh, it's going away and then it would be gone Jesus. and i would have those about every 30 minutes about a one minute moment of clarity but in the meantime i could hear everything right but it was literally like touch your finger to your thumb touch your finger to your thumb i couldn't do that right and then my right arm was completely paralyzed i still have a lot of paralyzation in these fingers right and i'm just sitting there i'm like just touch your nose and like littlest accomplishments like and that would, okay that would give me hope and um it fucking sucked <laughs> and so then my wife my daughter flew in and my wife's like i have to go pick up taylor right and she went to go pick up Tay-Tay and came back. And I'm like, just don't scare Taylor. And so I remember just sitting there like, please, God, just give me a moment to where I can speak clearly. And when my daughter walked in the room, I, I spoke clearly. Was it just for a brief moment or you were able to? From no, now? for the rest of the time. Oh, shit. I was able to speak clearly. But my, my arm was paralyzed. Wow. And... um which sucks. I'm like, damn, I shoot right-handed. <laughs> so, uh, Does it affect you now being able to shoot? Um, no, my, I got my trigger finger. I just, these fingertips I can't feel. So I have to squeeze really hard on the gun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, from that point on, the, the great part was, you know, when they did all my neurological exams, they're like, okay, we're really lucky. We don't see any trauma to your brain whatsoever or to, to the left side of your brain. I'm like, okay, what about the right? Like, what do you mean? I'm like, why? Well, I, I, you should see trauma on the right side of my brain. So they leave for like six hours. They came back and like 20 doctors come in the room. Like, you need to explain to us what you've done because we don't see any damage to your brain at all. And they had my old scans. Like, you need brain injuries don't heal. I'm like, well, I've had stem cells. I've done the hyperbaric chamber. You know, I've done, I've done 5-MeO-DMT three times and it's the only known drug to actually uh, heal brain tissue. Like, and I, you know, I did the intravenous stem cell therapy and they were like, Mr. Cirillo, you don't have any brain damage at all. And that was one of those things where that was another epiphany, like shit works. So you, you did the Mexico trip three? No, the Mexico trip one time, and then I've done the five MMO twice since then. You can do that. There's just places in America you can do it. Oh, okay. that's just the, uh, the the hit, taking the yeah. hits. Yeah, just three hit, three or four hits. Yeah, I got you. And that's a, kind of a tune up for me. Like my, my peace and tranquility lasts about six to eight months, and then – I'll start feeling a little bit of the darkness come back. Like, and normally I'll know it when I'm driving. Like, somebody will cut me off. Like, like, whoa, we don't want that dude back. And so I'll make the phone call. Like, hey, when can I get scheduled? Yeah. You know, and hey, go down. Usually go to Austin in that area, and you know, spend an hour with my with my doctor. And yeah, you know, I'm good. What, for are are those uh, trips or whatever treatments? Are they similar to the first one that you had? Or are they very different? 
each one gets better. Yeah, the, the, the darkness of them is usually after the first dose. And then the next doses after that last one, I did four doses. And it was just because I was in such this amazing place with my mom. I, I just didn't want it to end. Yeah. But it was the very first time that I said goodbye too. Oh, wow. Like I literally watched her leave mm. and it was just like, oh, it was just really, really, I don't know. It's like when you, when you, when I left my home, I left saying I'm never coming back. I guess there's a lot of turmoil, right? And my mom didn't come to my wedding. My mom was not there for the births of any of my children. She really wasn't part of my children's lives. I wouldn't allow her to. Mm. And at the end of her life, she was really, really good guy, really nice guy. Um, and so when I came back from therapy, I called her and, and you know, I just told her, I'm like, I forgive you. My mom had a lot of mental, mental health issues. And so we get about 15 minutes in a conversation before her darkness would start. I'm like, okay, I got to go. And I accepted that. Like, hey, for 15 minutes, I get to have my mom and, after that, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hang up, and I'm not gonna judge her. I'm not gonna. I love her. She did the best she could. She was a little girl. We started having us, and I forgive her. And the the, but I missed a lot of years, mm -hmm. right? I missed a lot of years, and it's and I and I, I feel a lot of. It's probably the only guilt I still have today, is that I do have a really good life now, right? And. You know, when you when you're when you're an executive at a healthcare company and you own a you own your own personal businesses, you know it, it, it can be lucrative. And I wish that I had had this, you know, five six years ago, so that I could buy my mom her house, yeah, and get her the help that she needed and things of that nature, you know. And sure. I didn't, so that's it's probably the the thing that bothers me. So if I can spend time with her every now and then, I, I take it. Yeah, oh, I'm tracking. Um, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, the I, I've heard. You know, you're one of several guests that I've had on that have been through that process, and uh, and each kind of speaks to it in a similarly um, amazing fashion or life changing fashion. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 really really interesting stuff. Some of the other stuff that you mentioned that when you were talking about the helmet uh, that can kind of halfway lift it off. It was ketamine and what else? Ketamine, MDNA, you know, psilocybin. Oh. They're, they're, you know. I think it all comes down to the severity of what's going on with you, which is why I'm the guy who says, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you to speak to a licensed clinical doctor, yeah. a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and let them define what therapy. And that's the issue that I'm running into a lot is that a lot of guys are going for the home run and not doing the, the steps prior. Not getting the you base know, like, hits for I heard this Mexico thing's worse. Let me go. I'm like, okay, do you even know what you're going for? Yeah. Right? And it's funny because they, they, they ask you, like, what do you, I went down there thinking going for something completely different. And I won't dissuade guys from going, but at the same time, like, I wanted to change. I knew my life was in utter and complete disarray. I had the greatest job known to mankind working for a gazillionaire doing the most amazing things. And I was broken. I was going to lose it all because of my own complete, total fault. Yeah. Like, you look in the mirror, everything that's going wrong is completely my fault. You know, and I needed to make a change. And I, I think that a lot of guys go down there thinking like, oh, I just want to change a little bit. And it's like, then don't go. You know, try something else. And sometimes maybe psychedelics aren't the, aren't the only answer. You know, maybe there are guys who just need to talk. And that's the, the conundrum you get into because you don't know anybody's trauma. Everybody's trauma is different. But I always say, let doctors and psychologists choose what path you should go down. Not okay. your buddy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I also I think for for a lot of folks, um, not knowing where you know who to turn to on that is is probably the biggest struggle because there's also a lot of bullshit out yes. there. You know, there, there's. I mean, let, let's be honest. Like the the bulk majority of of psychotherapists in this country are going to put you on fucking Lexapro and Xanax and fucking one just tried to be the other day, you know, <laughs> or, you know, all, all those types of big pharma, uh, drugs. And, and, you know, I'm not a hundred percent skeptical on, on that stuff, but I'm 99% skeptical. You know, I, I am sure that there are some people that all things considered, even the stuff that you're talking about, maybe something like that is still the better choice. Maybe, but I think in most cases it's not. You know, I mean, that's just my take on it, but, um, I'm not saying it hasn't helped people. And if, and if it does fantastic, but I think it's grossly, uh, over prescribed, you know, and, and used as a crutch or a permanent band aid. Yeah. 
you know, that, that it, like to me, the goal shouldn't be to find something that you can take for the rest of your life. I mean, that, that's just my take. It, it's if something helps, you know, connect dots or, or bridge a gap that gives you an ability to, uh, you know, to get where you need to be ultimately, then fantastic. Uh, but so I guess my question would be then, do you have recommendations of from both a process standpoint and a list of, of providers that that um, lean on that type of stuff more on uh, or at least as much on natural and, and uh, you know, whether it's psychedelics or, you know, the, the full blown Ibogaine stuff or whatever, they're at least as open to that as they are the big pharma stuff. Are there? Yeah, the list is growing. That's a great thing. And you know, the the, the bad part is it's really country. It's really geographical. So from Texas west, the the knowledge and the ability to understand <clears throat> those drugs is vastly outweighs the knowledge on the east coast. And the east coast, what I've discovered, and obviously I I work in these hospitals and I work around these clinicians. One, the knowledge barrier is vast. So people don't even know it exists. And two, the natural response is to go back to pharmaceuticals. You know, and, and it, it's like, you know, there's other ways, you know. And it, you know, it comes all the way down to, to all things like pain management. Oh, okay, I'm going to take pain management drugs. Well, how about you just stretch? How about you just eat a better diet? Stop eating so much red meat, eat more greens and vegetables. You know, I don't even take aspirin. I've had more surgeries than I, probably anybody I know, right? After getting blown up and whatever, it's like, I don't even take aspirin. You know, and, and I don't consider myself perfectly healthy, but I also sit there and go, all I did was eat drugs. I ate every known pill you they, they would give me, you know, Adderall, freaking Ambien, frick, you know, pro, pro, um, Provigil, you name it, man, Lexaprol, Codeine. I ate it all, handfuls of it. Did, did any of it do what it was supposed to do no, for you? None of it. None of it. You know, and it's funny, as I, I went to my annual checkup, and um, the, she's asking me, you know, this, this nerd, the doctor who I literally was like, just listening to you talk disgusts me, you know, <laughs> because she's sitting there and she's talking, you know, she's when she, she's, I won't get into that part, but everything that I said, she literally shit on. She's like, oh, well, what, what do you do? You know, what do you do for this? I'm like, I take fish oil. You know, like, oh, well, you know, if you took this pharmaceutical, you know, the fish oil is not regulated. It's over the counter. Nobody knows how much is in it, whatever, whatever. I'm like. I, I don't take pills. I drink it from a bottle with a teaspoon, you know? And, and she's like, Oh, I'm like, I take five HTP for my moods. To, can you, she's like, well, nobody knows what's in five HTP. It's just an over the counter. You should be taking this. And that's a controlled substance. It's FDA approved. I'm like every single thing that I've talked about, fish oil, glucosamine, you know, melatonin, you've, you've basically shit on yeah. and told me I should take the opposite pharmaceutical drug. Yeah, and they're also, they're also naturally occurring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whereas the shit you're talking about is all man-made. Yeah, like I, I, for the first time in my life, I sleep like eight, 10 hours a night. Yeah. I don't have bad dreams. I'm not sore. Yeah. I'm not beat up, you know, and I've switched my diet to a, basically a plant-based diet. I'm not a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian. I just decrease the amount of meat that I eat. Yeah. And it's made for my body made a little bit of difference, you know, and I don't kill myself on workouts anymore, trying to deadlift four oh five for sets of twenty, you know. Yeah. So but it was just hard to be there with a doctor. I'm like, Yeah, you and then you know, looking at her, I'm like, You're not even close to healthy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I know. You get that a lot where these doctors are who are telling you you need to do this and, yeah. and stop doing that? And you look at them and like, who the fuck are you to tell anybody anything on on how they should be improving things? Yeah. You know, it's like it's hard too because you know my company doctor is a, a very famous doctor, but he's not allowed to be my general practitioner. Yeah. So if you want to get meds, you know I have to have my heart medication, right? I have to. That's the fact of life, and so I have to go to a regular physician for that. Whereas I work with Doctor Clarko, who is this world famous doctor, yeah. who's like, oh, take this supplement, do this, you know, boom, and you know, has lowered my cholesterol by like 40 points. My joints don't hurt. You know, he's everything for him is natural. Yeah. You know, that's cool. Uh, in terms of those resources, is there somewhere like for people listening that, that they could turn to or go to for uh, a, a list or a database of starting that process of wanting to talk to somebody to, uh, you know, at least engage with a, a physician uh, that has the ability and, and the uh, open mindedness to uh, go down the route of um, psychedelics as well as uh, big pharma stuff? 
Yeah. So if they're if they're big farm, if they want to go traditional, they can obviously contact American Addiction Centers, right? Okay. We are we're a big pharma company, and then we will be rolling into more and more experimental stuff as we go. That's the hopefully the the path that we go down. And we, you know, for everybody in our company, we would love to be years ahead on the other side. But we are a very big company, and we have to do any if it's not <coughs> FDA approved, we can't even touch it, right? Yeah. Um, and to me, I think one helps the other. Right. Like you said, there are people who need those type of drugs to just to get by. The flip side is if you're a military guy, there's a website called Veterans Seeking Treatment. So it's just called VETS. You can go there, fill out a questionnaire, and it'll essentially guide you into you are a person, a good candidate for this therapy. If you're a civilian, you go to what's called the Baclor Institute, B-A-K-L-O-R. And same thing, questionnaire there, and Diane will go ahead and guide you through the process. In the future, there will be another website coming out that's completely government funded, massive amount of funding. We just did a big uh, presentation, the Army Air Force game here in Dallas. And so that's going to be called the Military Wellness Initiative. And what the Military Wellness Initiative is, our goal is it for be a one-stop shop. It's a one-stop shop before you come in the military to say, hey, here's what you need to do to get physically and mentally prepared to go in the military. A one-stop shop in the military to go, here's some family counseling, here's some counseling, here's you know, dietary, whatever. And then post-military, here is how to get healthy mentally, physically, emotionally, job placement service. Credit. It's basically $30 million in DOD funding. Oh, wow. And another SEAL is leading that. And Scott Ellison, um, very big powerhouse DC guy, um, brilliant human being, incredibly caring. He is the, the creator of this initiative and has every who's who, you know, from Jill Biden to Sec, sec Def, Sec VA, they're all on board with this. And that's the one issue we've all discovered is that there's too many people giving too much advice. We need a one place where it comes to them. Right now, the Military Wellness Initiative will be that place. Okay. Uh, Producer Johnny, can you link all that shit in the description? Yeah. Basically everything he just said. Um, awesome. Uh, anything else that, uh, that you can add in terms of where people can find you if they want uh, any of the things that you've talked about, whether it's security or the vet stuff or... Uh, I know you're in, in part uh, with Navy SEALs Fund, uh, anything Spartan 7 related. Uh, if you could just kind of talk about uh, where people can find you for all that stuff. Yeah, so uh, Spartan 7 Incorporated is our website. Um, that's my personal website, obviously, and it's pretty vague. I keep it that way intentionally. You know, like we're, we, we don't do any advertising. You know, we don't do any marketing. So the good thing for us in Spartan 7 Adventure, we're able to sell those adventures out without having to go beat the bush. We've had a gr great group of clients here for a long time. Most of it, corporate clients who buy an entire event. We do have open events there and they're fun. If somebody wants to get away as far as um, executive retreats, you can go play golf or go to the strip club or you can come hang out with a bunch of really, really notable seals. Yeah. Um, and I'm talking some notable ones and hang out with a weekend, learn to yeah. shoot, learn to clear houses, learn to shoot pigs out of helicopters, race cars. We do those type things. Nice. That's the Spartan 7 adventure side. Spartan 7 Security, same exact thing. You know, our staff is very highly vetted uh, law enforcement, federal law enforcement, uh, special operations, military guys to provide uh, very highly qualified security. Um, there's that. And then, you know, to get a hold of me, pretty simple, Dan Cirillo on Instagram. Um, I do have a personal account, but I keep that funny. <laughs> and Spartan 7 Adventure on Instagram. And then uh, American Addiction Centers is my, my, my full-time job. Yeah. That's awesome stuff, man. I got to tell you, it's been a, a fascinating conversation, a uh, wide range of topics, and uh, just a super interesting fucking story that you have, man. I, I really appreciate you coming here and sharing it. We've known each other for a number of years now, but it's nice to sit down and actually uh, talk about your story because it's, uh, it's a, a good one and one that should be told. So uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to come here and tell it. And uh, anything else you want to add? Yeah, add one thing. I my answer when the, when your guy called me about being on this podcast was, "Are you fucking kidding me?" <laughs> <laughs> so I've been so excited to come on this. Oh, you know, awesome, like I, I get invited to podcasts, and you know I, I do them, but I have been so excited to come do this one. Yeah. Like, awesome, it, man. I'm a nerd. I'm a fan. <laughs> you know, I'm not very fan of very many people. I just I think you're a cool motherfucker. I've oh, always thought that you're so mellow. You know, we have the same friends. You know, Shane's my bro. Like, yeah. and I. For me, I would like to one day when I decide to take a sabbatical from work, retire and come literally learn how to handle dogs with you. Oh, that's kind of a big dude. goal that I've always yeah. had. So, well, I mean, you're you're always welcome. So, I'd lo love to have you. So, hopefully, I'll be retired by then too. There but, you go. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can just fuck around with dogs all day. 
most people think I do that uh, as it is, but uh, there's quite a bit more to it than that. Just just like anybody uh, anybody's um, area of expertise or whatever profession they're in, and, and what what they actually do versus what people think they do. But uh, but uh, yeah, I'd love love to have you. I appreciate the kind words. Um, it's uh, it's it's humbling for sure to to hear you say that. And uh, yeah, I've I've, I've loved uh, loved having you on. So thanks for coming. To you assholes, uh, and I and I you, I do use that term uh, endearingly. I've used the term civilian asshole a few times, and there's been people that uh, get all offended about it. it. It's a fucking joke, first of all. Um, uh, you know, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's from a movie. I don't remember which one, but that that's where I I originally drew off of it three years ago when I first said it on here. I was like, and you and for you civilian assholes, like it was a, a movie reference, and people take it serious, and whatever. But anyway. Uh, I do appreciate the hell out of your guys' support. Um, you know, it, it, it is a, a very humbling position to be in, to be able to sit here and, and interview guys like Dan and, and all of the, the wonderful guests that I've had over the years. Uh, I, I do take it very seriously from prep to the actual conducting of the interview and, uh, and afterwards. And, um, but I, you know, for me, it's, it, it's just an amazing position to be in, to, to be able to do this. I mean, I, I do really, view it as as getting to do this uh and i don't take that lightly nor do i take it for granted uh, i damn sure don't take your guys support for granted so thank you uh for tuning in uh show after show we appreciate you uh if you didn't like the episode you know you get to choke yourself and uh until next time this is mic drop mm-hmm.